Oakwood Ice, far and near and here. Happy Sabbath and welcome to Alumni Weekend. My name is Matthew Bowen. And I'm Lizbeth Figueroa Pena. And we are both students here, and we're so happy to have you join us for Sabbath School. That will be starting very, very soon. You know, I think that Alumni Weekend is just an awesome experience. Like yesterday, I had the privilege of speaking to different alumni and just hearing what Alumni Weekend means to them. And they were saying it means family, it means community, it means feeling rejuvenated, replenished, and just seeing the familiar faces that make the Oakwood experience come to life once again. Right, and I think Alumni Weekend has gotten off to a great start. On Wednesday, we had our second annual Raw concert. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so at this concert, we were able to see all the choirs at Oakwood, DP, VOT, New Song, Aeolians. and the Aeolians come together to sing a wonderful medley that truly blessed all of us there. And we want to shout out Mari Owani and his Raw Ministries team. They've done a great job on doing that last year and this year. And the whole purpose of the Raw concert is to just let people know there's no competition between the choirs. We are one big Oakwood family. Yes, and as Raw Ministries strives to create this culture, we really got to see what raw, real, authentic worship is. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's been many events all throughout the week. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But were you there for Oakwood Honors last night? Oh, I was. I was. Man, Oakwood Honors. It was incredible. So we had four honorees this year. We had Rice Davis from... Dynamic Praise. You know, DP is celebrating DP 35 this weekend. Absolutely. And then we had, what's her name? Auntie Lois, Lois mm -hmm. Peters, who's a big, generous donator to Oakwood. We also had Mark Washington, who's an Oakwood alumnus that works in the Department of Education in the federal government. And then finally, we had the one and only, the legend, Wintley Phipps. I really think it was a blessing. And... I also really got to appreciate the different alumni that came to speak at the, all the different departments. Um, there was people coming to speak to the business majors, social work majors, biology majors. And it's just wonderful getting to hear the experience of people that have walked in our shoes and have gone to the places we want to walk to as well. Right, and as both first-generation Oakwoodites, it's been really cool to see all of these legacy families, all of these legacy students just celebrate their heritage, and their Oakwood history. And that brings us to our Oakwood experience. What's it like being a first gen? You know, for me, it's really interesting. I have one of those testimonies that some of us share where I was not planning to come to Oakwood at all, but God knew what he was doing when he redirected my steps and brought me right here. So from my remembrance, you literally <laughs> decided you were going to Oakwood the night before you left for Southern. Yes, the night before I went to Southern, I got this phone call from a friend, and he was like, rethink this. I got off the phone, and then I just felt like my heart was saying, go to Oakwood. Go right. to Oakwood. Had all the bags packed to go to Southern Adventist University, and makes a shift, comes to Oakwood. Tell us how it all worked out. You had no room. You had nothing picked out. Tell us how that worked out. Well, I see, I think God is a very funny God, because... When he redirects your steps, he makes sure that everything is in place so you're able to walk in his calling. So I was able to find a room, get a major, get a campus job, get everything settled. And it just worked out wonderfully. But tell me, what's, what's your Oakwood experience like? Right. So myself, I also was going to go to Southern. And it's because I went to Georgia Cumberland Academy, which is an Adventist boarding school in North Georgia. So that's like right close to Southern. And all of my friends are going to Southern. And... Of course, I wanted to go there too. So it comes to Oakwood Live weekend, um, 2022. And I'm just, I feel pulled. I've never experienced worship like I experienced it at Oakwood. I haven't seen as many people who look like me in one place just being happy to be there. So I was like, eh, I'm gonna reconsider it. But then the rest of the school year goes by and I'm still stuck on Southern. I'm just, I wanna go there. And then finally spring break, um, of my senior year, God would not give me peace. So I figured, okay, Oakwood may be the place for me. So that's why I'm here and I'm happy to be wearing my blue and gold. You know, on to another topic. I hear you're running for Mr. Oakwood. Right. Um, I'm running to be the 11th Mr. Oakwood. And then shout out to Maya and Melody, who are running to be the 32nd 
um, Miss Oakwood University. So the pageant is tomorrow um, at 6 p.m. at the MAC. So you should definitely come out. But also there's going to be an alumni parade tomorrow. There's going to be a big expo. And of course, all of the festivities of today, like DP35, Sabbath school, church, um, the Aeolians concert later. There's just so much going on. Yeah, there's so much that none of us want to miss. So right now, I just invite you, share this blessing to your friends, your family members, your neighbors. You don't know how this program today can touch their lives. Right, and as Pastor Snell would say, be an Apple apostle, be a digital disciple. Make sure your people, Oakwoodites far near here, make sure everyone is tuning into Sabbath School that we're going to have going very, very soon. Absolutely. So my Oakwood experience has been more than running for Mr. Oakwood or serving in USM or, you know, just being at the CAF, being at the skating rink. We've been doing something called, what is it? Good, good morning. Good morning, OU. What's, what's good morning, OU? So good morning, OU is the newest university newscast, which is actually co-founded and co-anchored by us. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually a platform where we strive to bridge the gap between the communication on campus so that everyone can get to see what the students are doing, like in our newest series, This Is My OU. We're highlighting the different accomplishments that the students have done, their innovations, all the things that they bring to the table. So we really get to see what's happening that we don't typically, typically see. We're getting to see the students that make Oakwood, Oakwood. Right, and we have some awesome students. We have students who are um, doing research for NASA. We have students who are working in the federal government and top secret agencies. We have students who are winning these national awards and I'm just so happy to be friends with these people, you know? You know, a lot of great people come through Oakwood. Right, and so the reason why we wanted to start Good Morning OU is because I remember last year, it was the USM banquet and um, she was all dressed up to go to the banquet and somebody asked her, hey, where are you going? And you know, it's a banquet, like everybody at campus should know what's happening. It's our Adventist prom, our veggie prom, but people didn't know what was going on. And so we saw, okay, we need to change that. We need to make sure that people know what's going on, where it's happening and how they can be a part of it. Absolutely. So, you know, there's so many things we get to learn as we walk through these halls and these sidewalks of Oakwood University's campus. But tell me, what's something that you've learned? What's one of the lessons Right. So my main lesson being at Oakwood is a very simple lesson. You want to go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. Um, I came from a, I came from a background of going to predominantly white schools and then going to mixed schools and then going to black schools, right? Um, but only at Oakwood, only at Oakwood, can you be in a community of people who love you, who support you. Shout out to my campus mom, Elaine Isaac who makes sure that I have food, who, who visited me in the hospital um, during freshman year when I had this um, life-threatening situation, who just, people like Elaine Isaac, who look out for you. That's what I love about Oakwood, and that's been my lesson. What about you? What have you learned being here? I have learned that God has a blessing for us every single day. Even though the, some days may be rough, some days may be great, but every day there's something new, something great we can see from what God has for us. And... With that, I want to invite you to tune in to our Sabbath school where we can continue to experience this Oakwood greatness. All right, we'll see you later. Bye bye now. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Oakwood's homecoming alumni. My name is Tiffany Claiborne, and I am a part of the illustrious class of 2004. This morning, I have the privilege of facilitating a discussion about this week's Sabbath School lesson, an awesome lesson about waiting on the Lord. But I am not the only individual. I am surrounded by individuals from the class of 2004 and also the class of 1979. So we will get started by asking Brother Chris to introduce himself, and please say your name and your class. Christopher Thompson, class of 2004. I'm Justin Kelly. Also, the class of 2004. Dr. Kim Logan Nolan, the great class of 1979. <laughs> Dr. Brian Smith, class of 79, the most intelligent class. Ooh. Oh boy, oh boy. Oh boy. 
starting off for Ralph. <laughs> LaShawn Davis, the illustrious and sophisticated class of 2004. Amen. My name is Dr. Leticia Barksdale, class of 2004. Pastor David Long, the class of 2000, oh, oh, yes, the yes, class yes. of 1979. <laughs> we are accepting any candidates that would All like right. to switch to our class. Pastor Long. Um, well, to get started with our discussion this morning, I would like to ask this question to the group. The question is, what are some words that come to mind when you think about waiting? Frustration. Yes. Fatigue. Mm. Impatience. Mm. Accountability. Mm. Stillness, for some reason. Mm. It seems like these words have negative connotations mm -hmm. as opposed to positive Absolutely. connotations. Absolutely. We don't necessarily like to wait at all. This is leading us into our discussion, so we're going to open with prayer, and then we're going to have a beautiful selection by another member of the class of 2004. So let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to speak about you. Be with us this morning and help us to represent you in your name. Amen. 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 Now we'll have Shalana. Good morning, beautiful people. Good morning. Class of 2004, thank you so much. It is a blessing to be with you today. My name is Shay Chin King, and I'm so glad to worship out loud this morning with you. Worship with me, if you would, as we welcome the Holy Spirit into this place. to the 
Morning and happy Sabbath. Please stand for opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to be in your presence. Lord, be with us as we learn how to wait patiently on you. Help us to know that within you we are much more than enough. Thank you for hear hearing and answering this prayer. Amen. That was an amazing song by Shay, truly a blessing. She must have been an Aeolian. She, um, she was not, but she was part of the class of 2004. <laughs> you get kudos for that. Thank you so much. I feel the love. Um, I, I wanted us, again, a few moments ago, right before Shay sang, we mentioned some words about waiting related to waiting, and the majority of them were negative, except for the stillness, which I liked as well, the stillness aspect. I want us to go to this verse, John chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 2 and verse 3, and I'm going to ask LaShawn if you could read that, please. John chapter 14, verse 2 and verse 3, because the lesson was talking about waiting, and these two verses mention something that are related to waiting. So, LaShawn, if you could read that for us, please. Sure. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And you said two through four? Two through three. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Amen. Amen. And then Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 and verse 13. And Dr. Smith, I'm going to ask if you could please read that for us as well. Revelation 22, verse 12 and verse 13. And these are verses that we're kind of familiar with, right? Jesus letting us know he's coming back. Verse 12. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Amen. Amen. Wonderful words. Jesus has promised to come back for us. He's preparing a place for us. But at this moment in time, what are we doing? We're waiting. waiting. We're waiting. And we just said the negative words that are attached to waiting. I want to ask you, and I think you'll guess, there's one place that no one likes, but we all have to go there, and we have to wait for long periods of time. If you need anything for your car, That's right. you have to go to this place. What are we talking about? DMV. The DMV. When you're waiting at the DMV, I just recently had to go to the DMV, there's no excitement or happiness attached <laughs> to waiting at the DMV. You're kind of trying to manage your emotions as you're waiting, right? So now, bringing it back home, as Christians, we are still waiting for Jesus' return. So as we're jumping into this lesson, what feelings do you have attached to that waiting? And we'll go around. I'll start with you, Pastor Long, and then we'll go around. Well, as I think about heaven and what it affords us or what, what we look forward to, there's, there's an excitement there for that. Um, as 
the song says we're going to see Peter, James, and John, but most of all, we're going to see Jesus. Amen. So looking forward to that uh, brings great excitement. When I think about waiting um, for the Lord's return, if I'm being honest, yes. right, yes. sometimes it brings up feelings of anxiety mm -hmm. because I am not where I need to be mm -hmm. in my walk. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it, mm -hmm. and I don't want it to be that way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning, even still at blah, blah, blah years of age, <laughs> Um, how to de <laughs> thank you, <laughs> how to de de develop my relationship with Christ so that it's not an anxious feeling when I think about um, Christ's return, mm. but more of a, oh man, I can't wait. Mm. Yeah. Mm. True. Mm. Leaning off that sentiment, I think uh, we're in a unique space because if you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have given you a different response. But on this day, at this time, I'm just trying to not get caught off guard and uh, stay prayed up even when I feel uh, not confident about where I am in life and just know that when he comes, he's got me, right? Because life has done some things and if I'm honest about even being in grade school, he should have been here by now in terms of what we're taught and how we're branded. And he has still yet to come. So as we hold on to that hope and still choose to believe that he will come soon, hopefully I'll just wait patiently through the process and endure what life continues to bring. So I think there's another text in the Bible that says something like, occupy until I come. So that means I have to continue doing what God asked me to do, and that could be preaching the gospel to the rest of the world, of course, in my own way. And I think that's how I look at waiting for Jesus' return. I think sometimes we make it more difficult than what it is. When you look at God's word, it's simple. And the key factor in waiting is trusting. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord yes. with all yes. thine heart. Yes. And lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, yes. and he shall direct thy path. So if you connect the waiting with the trust, Amen. then you're going to be able to navigate successfully to what God is leading you to do. But without that trust, you're going to fail and you're navigating we use our GPS to help us to navigate. Mm. You know, we need to use God's GPS. Trust, faith, and then you will be able to wait. Amen. 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 Thanks. Thank you. I think, uh, so the Occupy thing is, is huge, Doc. I really appreciate you saying that because that changes the way waiting uh, feels. And so oftentimes in my life, I, uh, I coped with waiting, even little waiting, like at the bank or at the, at the grocery store, with just sort of not emotionally investing in the thing I'm waiting for, wow. so I don't feel the same pain and anxiety sitting in line or waiting for, for Jesus to come. And that may not be the best thing, um, but when I am, uh, the, the times that I am operating in what God has given me, and I see, uh, I don't know if this analogy works, but you know, there's little chips in the line at the checkout counter, right? It's not really the food that I'm about to pay for, but it's like, okay, we're, we're going somewhere. Um, and that helps build that trust um, when, when I'm working on, on, on the things that God has given me. And so that's beautiful. So I have different feelings at different times depending on uh, if I'm in the spirit or not. That's fair. I'm going to build on what Dr. Smith said and share Matthew 24, 46. It says, blessed is that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. And so along those lines of occupying that we have work to do. And Jesus said, I must work while it is day, for night comes when no man can work. But the Lord is coming back. Yeah. Yeah. And I want the Lord to find me faithful and, 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 and committed to the task. Amen. I don't want to be caught idle and hanging out and chilling, sitting down on the job. I want to be faithful right. when the Lord comes. Amen. 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 Something that's interesting is we each had different responses to that question, right? right? 
there is this mix of emotions that is attached to waiting on God. There are those days when we feel good. God, I'm excited. You, your son Jesus is coming back. Come on that cloud, Lord. I'm ready. Yes, indeed. And then there are those days, hold up. I, I'm not really sure. Give me one more moment. And then you can come. So the lesson brought out so many amazing points to help us avoid this mixture of emotions. How can we find this stability as Christians on our walk with God? So I want us to look at some of the main points from the lesson. I'll mention them up front and we'll go through them. The very first thing the lesson brought out was from Sunday's lesson, and I retitled it, um, Our Focus While We Wait. What are we to focus on? I think Dr. Smith and Chris kind of spoke to this as well. We're going to look then at our relationship with God while we wait. Next, remembering past blessings while we wait. And then experiencing God's rest while we wait. In other words, we want to learn how to wait well. Right. So I want to ask you this question, and then we're going to go into some Bible verses. And for those following along, we're moving into Sunday's lesson. The title of the lesson is The Call of Waiting. Here's the question I want to put to the group, the panel. In your opinion, why specifically is waiting in general so hard? We don't like waiting. If we're very honest, we want what we want when we want it. Why is waiting so hard? Anyone can chime in. Why do you think waiting is so difficult? Well, I think, I think it's difficult because we're focused on the end result mm. and the product mm. rather than the process and what is happening to us and for us in the process. My grandmother said to me one time, she said, uh, son, sometimes the Lord, you have to wait because the Lord is moving things and people, right? And we don't want things to be moved out the way. We don't want things in ourselves to be moved out the way, but the process is valuable and we need the process while we wait. I think part of the difficulty with waiting is if we think about it on a biological level, um, when we receive pleasure, we get immediate surges of dopamine, right? I want it what I want. I got it. Oh, I'm excited. Dopamine, yeah. right? And so we are so used, especially now in this day and age when things are like this, right? We're so used to getting it and our dopamine centers are hit, hit, hit. You get a text message, dopamine. You get a like on Instagram, dopamine. And so it makes it difficult because when we, I guess, switch to the Christianity or the Jesus coming back, it's not now. So that dopamine surge is not given to us now. And so we're just like, oh. <laughs> And so if I, if it becomes I, a problem. Yeah. On that, yeah. as, as someone who's not at all a medical doctor, um, uh, from what I've understood, there's a process of dopamine that can come from being invested in the process. And we see it in bodybuilders, right? Like, oh, it hurts so good. What? That's insane. But they have become used to anticipating the reward. And so now they're invested in the process and they get the dopamine mm -hmm. as well. And so there's the dopamine that comes from, and this might be correct, but somewhere in the back of our brain, like mm -hmm. the lizard brain type thing. And then there's the circuits we're forming in the frontal lobe, mm -hmm. right? Our thinking, our processing, our reasoning, our spirituality. And when that process becomes something we're invested in, when we, uh, the Bible says, delight in the Lord, Come right? On now. Come on and now. so now we're confused, like, why is someone so excited about going through this difficult on. time? Because they've built up this, I, I, I think of it almost as a muscle yeah. in their thought process. And so that process of developing that investment in the process, mm. the yeah. process of the process, I'm yeah. just saying yes. words now. So could you that, that takes time. You could relate that to selfishness? Mm. Absolutely. It, it's um, completely opposed because in my, in my, 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 my flesh, right, um, I'm all about myself and I've been like that since before I was born, right? <laughs> that there wasn't even other people in my brain mm. when I came out, right? And over the process of growing and learning about God and developing, we understand there's other people and that they also are important, that they also are loved by God. And they also, um, I grow from putting them before myself. And so that's a, a process, a process of development that keeps going up. Let me just give you two words, instant gratification. Yes. When you're dealing with substance abusers, and the reason why they use drugs, because they want that instant gratification. 
I don't want to hurt. I don't want to be in pain. You look at people who gamble, instant gratification. I'm going to try to fix this problem by gambling more. When you're dealing with individuals or the mindset that I want what I want when I want it and how I want it, I'm not thinking about what? Consequences. And that's where people fall short. Now, again, let's go to the word. He that dwelleth in the secret place Come on. Come on. of the Most High will dwell under the wings of the Almighty, Psalms 91.1. And so therefore, if I'm dwelling with God, I'm not going to be anxious, anxious. I'm not going to be stressed. I'm not going to be in an era of depression because I'm waiting on him because I'm dwelling with him. So we've got to get past that microwave mindset. Pop, 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 pop goes the weasel. No, we have to take our time or that popcorn going to burn. So instant gratification, stay away from that. Look at your consequences and your choices and dwell with the Lord. Amen. And the reason for that is a model that Oakwood uses, enter to learn, depart yes. to serve. We can't serve when we're thinking about self. Amen. I was just going to add the first thing that came to mind, and I was going back and forth whether I would say it, but I believe my first mom predisposed me to impatience because had she just stuck by my first father and waited to see what could have developed and what God wanted to show in the Garden of Eden, what could life have been like? I was so nervous for you. What could life have been like? Um, but we're here now, and we are learning how to be better markers of things that we've developed within and that we're predisposed to, that are handed down from us generationally, that we need to hone in on and work harder to rid ourselves of so that we can tap into the spiritual aspects of truly being able to wait and trust in the Lord, but it's a battle of the flesh. Yes. Mm, amen, amen. All right, I want us to go to these verses because so many great points are brought out. Uh, I would like to ask um, LaShawn, I'm sorry, Leticia actually. Leticia, can you read Psalm 62, verse one and two? And then I'm gonna ask Dr. Logan if you can read Psalms 63, verse one. I didn't forget about you, I'll add you next. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go again, Psalms 62, verse 1 and 2. And again, the focus again is, what should our focus be while we're waiting? Go ahead. So I'm reading from the English Standard Version. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Amen. Amen. Before you read verse 1 of chapter 63. This kind of ties into what Dr. Logan mentioned. She mentioned instant gratification. As human beings, we're looking for the instant gratification, but we have to focus on God and remember who God is. So in the midst of our waiting, yes, it gets challenging. Yes, it gets difficult. We have hardships. But if we're keeping our eyes on God, who is our rock, our salvation, we can push through these difficult situations. And those verses remind us of that. And then verse 1 of Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Mm. Earnestly, I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Amen. And I just want to add to that. Man can make plans, but God makes decisions. Amen. Amen. Uh -oh. Amen. 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 That's a word. That's, yes. You want to add? Oh. I think something that we forget is really who we are and whose we are, right? You know, when you are hearing the same thing over and over again, it kind of loses its magnitude, the emphasis, right? Like, we are children of God. The God who created this earth, who created this world in six days, literally spoke it into existence. He's our Father. If we focus on that fact, the anxiety won't be there, right? But many times we forget that. And these verses are reminding us of who our Father actually is in the midst of us waiting for Jesus. Can I piggyback on that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes when other people tell us over and over, it loses yeah. its magnitude. Right. 
but when we remind ourselves and we talk to ourselves, and I'm a child of God, Come look on, in the mirror and say that every day, then it actually grows through magnitude. It becomes part of your, our, our thinking. Um, uh, the Bible describes the tongue as like a rudder steering mm. a powerful ship. Mm. And so, so often um, in the process of waiting, we're not aware of, uh, sometimes I make it hard on myself just mm. by the things I tell myself you know, every day. Um, but it can be made uh, a little bit easier, right? And so that process um, can make waiting much different. Amen. Can, can we talk about Psalm 63 verse 1? Like the, for me, like when I was reading this, the desperation. I, that's the word I have to, to use, the desperation of longing for God. Like the words that the psalmist used, like earnestly I seek thee. My soul thirsts. Like do you know, you know how it is to be thirsty yes. or what it is to be thirsty yes. and my flesh faints. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All of these words in the dry and weary, like just the desperation, the longing that we should have mm. for God, mm. even in that weight. You, you know, it sounds like an addict, and that's the kind of addict I want to be. Yeah. <laughs> an addict for the Lord. Oh, no. So then what is lacking? What, what are we missing then? Why don't we have this desperation? Why don't we have this longing and this earnest desire for God? I think if we're honest, it's not that we're lacking. It's that we have microwaves, you know, mm -hmm. as Dr. Logan Nolan said. We have something that we've replaced um, seeking God with. Uh, to our, you know, uh, shame and, and embarrassment. Like we wouldn't even share in public what those things are because they're, they're so terrible. I think as we think about, uh, Paul talks about Moses in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, how he understood he was willing to let go of the riches of Egypt mm -hmm. and all that because he was looking for something greater. Come on. So as we keep our eyes on the prize, as it were, Amen. you think about Olympic uh, individuals, they're, four years, they're training. Yes. How do they keep that intensity? I'm sure it drops off every now and then, but yes. if they're looking towards standing on that podium mm -hmm. with their flag or their, their country, representing their country, as they keep that in focus, mm -hmm. uh, they're driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, they rise 4 o'clock in the morning, I mean, yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning, hitting it every day at that level, but mm -hmm. only as they keep our eyes, their eyes on the prize, and that's why we have to keep our eyes on the prize by the grace so, of God. So the prize then... Is God. He, 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 he must That's be. It. So here goes. Wait on the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Mm -hmm. uh, be strong in the Lord. Here goes verse um, 27, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen Amen. your heart. So the source of our strength is God. Mm -hmm. And when we're waiting on God, if God is the prize, then we can dwell in God and be content in God because God is the one we're actually waiting Amen. on, not the thing. Oh, come on. I remember giving birth. I am going 39 hours with Micah. Oof, and the doctor said, all you can do is wait mm. until she is ready to come. And we're doing the countdown. And I went to Micah 7-7. Seven, seven. Mm. Wait, I say on the Lord. I said, I don't know who, what you are, but your name is going to be Micah <laughs> because I have to wait on the Lord. And, and we need to add that Micah is a part of the class of 2004. Yes. <laughs> the illustrious class. Good things come to those who wait. <laughs> yes, yes, All yes. Right, and, and I want to I wanna add to that Jeremiah 12.5. Mm -hmm. If we cannot walk with the footmen mm -mm. Mm -mm. and be patient in this process, how in the world are we going to contend with the horses? Yeah. Come on. Because if we go ahead of God, we're going to miss something. Yeah, true, true, so therefore, true. God has a process in what he's doing and how he's doing it. Amen. So remember, we have to learn to walk, mm. then we can run, mm -hmm. and then we will reach the kingdom. Amen. My pastor, Pastor Sherburn Jack in Atlanta, Georgia, he helps us to understand. He uses a phrase. He says, most of us are interested in deliverance when our difficulties, when it comes to that waiting on God. But God is interested in our development. Yes. Yes. And we, we, we develop through that process of waiting. Amen. And that's what allows us to grow and become all that God wants yes. us to do or become. And so as we wait, God is developing us so we can really receive what he wants us to receive. Amen. 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 And I can only process, piggybacking off Dr. Long, that we're so inconsistent. 
first person. I'm so inconsistent. So he has to continue to knock me down periodically so that I understand more deeply what he is really capable of and trying to teach me through this lifelong process. If I could just be a little more consistent, maybe he could withhold some of the foolishness, but it's through the foolishness that we oftentimes become the most grateful. And the, the connection with him is also the most deep thereafter. I wanna add to that, Micah from the class of 2004. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Micah Logan. Yes, yes. <laughs> she always says to me, Mom, show yourself some grace. Be gracious to yourself, Mom. You show grace to your patients, but you do not show grace to yourself. You're hard on yourself. And we tend to be very hard on ourselves. We're our own worst critic. So five words I want to share. Mm -hmm. Number one in this grace period is showing yourself the accountability. Yes. That where we are, mm -hmm. we're, we're not God. Mm -hmm. We're human beings and we have flaws. Mm -hmm. But through that, I'm going to be able to be aware of those flaws. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord to reveal those things to me. And then in the process, I will become consistent. Mm -hmm. And then in that other second half of that, I'm going to build integrity. I'm going to be honest with myself. A lot of times we're not honest with ourselves. And then the most important aspect is I will be able to navigate in a healthy manner. See, we need to be healthy Christians Amen. so that we can lead others to Christ. But if I'm not consistent, I'm going to do more damage than good. I love it. I love it. It seems like from what everyone has said about this portion of the Sabbath school lesson, if I was to summarize it in one sentence, it'd be, instead of focusing on our situations and our experiences, we have to focus on God, yes. right? Our situations will change, our experiences will change, but God never changes. Come on now. So in the midst of our waiting, we have to focus on God. And I, I wanna read one quote, uh, this is from Sunday's lesson, and then we're gonna move to Monday. It says, waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging on. It is a deep longing for God that is compared to intense thirst in a dry land, which is what you said, Leticia. The psalmist waits on many blessings from God, but his yearning to be brought close to his God surpasses any other desire and need in life. Focusing on God more than our experience. As we move into Monday's lesson, which again is now moving us to, in the midst of our waiting, now our relationship with God in the midst of waiting. I wanna ask this question. In your opinion, why is isolation so difficult, right? We all know the detrimental effects of the pandemic, right? And one of the main things that many individuals struggle with, and I think including us, was the isolation, right? Not being able to interact with people, right? Why do you think it's so devastating? Well, it's not just difficult, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. God created us for community. And creation was done in community. The Bible says, let us make man in our own image. So we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be in community because we grow, we learn, we thrive in community. Uh, the largest trees in the world grow in communities. They grow in groups. Aspen trees grow in groups. Um, the sequoias, they grow in groups. We grow farther when we go together. Mm, Amen. Powerful. Okay, sure. Can't be isolated. We sure. like, just like Chris was saying. We need mm. community, right? Mm. Who's going to encourage me mm. when I don't have it to give, yeah. right? When I am at my lowest, who's going to lift me up? Because sometimes I can't do it. Sometimes I can't do it. And I um I like the the verse in the Bible. You know, forsake not your yourselves. The, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, right? And it um, doesn't necessarily always mean church, but church is important. I don't want it. To, church is very I got important. you. I got you. We're but fine. I mean, but I mean, like, I need her. I can't. I need her, right? And so I cannot keep myself from her because I draw on her, and she draws on me. Yeah. And I think that is an important part of community to be able to uplift one another and to instill in each other something that is needed at a very specific point in time. 
I believe all of us are familiar with the song, I Need You, yes. You Need Me, We're All a Part of a God's on Me. And it's, it's truer than we think yeah. because it's, not, it's more than just words. We're mm. talking about that community. We really do need each other. Yeah, so true. I think, though, there are some other aspects of isolation. Yeah. Remember, Jesus fasted 40 days by himself. So there is some time when we need to be isolated so that we can uh, renew our relationship with God and better bless our friends. Mm. Amen. So true. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just going to say there, there's two things. Number one, we found ways to be in community in the pandemic, right? That Remember those drive-by birthday parties <laughs> and, and all of the Zoom birthday parties we attended? Yeah. But to the isolation piece, that Jesus went into isolation for specific purpose, right? Mm. And the Bible tells us, especially when husband and wife uh, need to separate for a moment, they do so for prayer, mm. right? And so whenever we are isolated, it has to be for a godly purpose and not just isolating ourselves and cordoning ourselves off from community because we need community. Mm. So. so a quick plug to everyone who has been blessed to survive our pandemic the, the core part of our pandemic process, go back to church, you know, um, find, find your community. I, to hear that your, your TV and your walls and your furniture have become your community, I rebuke that. Right. That is not accurate. We do need the tangible expressions of humans yeah. that we're interacting with, especially for our, our seniors. Um, who are battling loneliness. I mean, even our age group, we, we battle loneliness, loneliness and depression um, in epic proportions nowadays. But we need to tap into the deliverance that God has brought us from. And even if we don't go back to exactly the way things were, we do need each other. Amen. We need Amen. physical contact and interaction and largely that can still be found in church. If not the one that you're accustomed to, find a new one. And let's lean on each other and grow. Amen. You brought out an interesting point at the very end of your statement. You said that depression is a big thing, right? People feeling alone. Um, before we go to the verse, um, we're all familiar with the story of Elijah when he was running away from Jezebel, right? Oh, yeah. And to summarize, he basically said, God, take my life. I can't do this anymore, right? He was in a depressed state, right? The interesting thing is, in that moment, was Elijah isolated? Was he alone? The, the, an the answer is no. I like you. Um, <laughs> I I'm asking that question because I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, right? Because remember, we're talking about waiting on the Lord. And as Christians, there are moments when we feel isolated. God, where are you? Why can't I feel you? But is this really what's happening? What does Hebrews 13, uh, verse 5 say? I'm going to ask Justin if you can read that for us, please. Hebrews 13, verse 5. And it's the latter portion that's important. All right. Hebrews 13, 5. I'm reading from ESV. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from, the love, from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it's that point, right? Because we have all experienced it, right? We're waiting for Jesus to come back. There are those good days and those bad days, those days when we feel like, oh, I feel the love of God just surrounding me, yes. And then there are those moments when we're crying out to God, why are you not here? Why can't I feel you with me? Meanwhile, God has said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've already let you know, I'm right by your side. When Elijah was feeling that depressed state, God was right there with him. So as we're waiting for Jesus' return, it is going to be difficult, but he wants us to remember this. So I want us to go to a few verses that speak about what our relationship with God should look like while we're waiting. So we have a series of verses, so I'm going to go, Dr. Long, can you get Psalms chapter 145, verse 18? I'm going to ask Chris if you wouldn't mind doing James chapter 4, verse 8. We'll come back over and I'm going to ask Leticia, can you do Psalms 34, verse 18? And again, we're talking about what our relationship with God should look like while we're waiting. Psalms 145, 18 says, The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him and all that call upon him in truth. Amen. James 4, verse 8. 
no worries, as you're looking for it, um, that right there is, uh, you, earlier, Dr. Uh, Logan, you said, it's really simple, right? It's very simple. God's saying, call on me, and I got you. Mm -hmm. I got your back, right? We all know that individual. If we call them, he or she has my back, right? It's my real old dog. Depending on how old you are, you might know that. Um, so, God and, you know, saying, and Tiffany, you know yes. what? You know what I do every morning? Mm. I stand up against the wall, mm. and I say, God, you have my back. Come on. I have your back. Come on now. What do you need me to do? Because do you know God is patiently waiting on us? He's waiting. Mm -hmm. And so every morning I say, how are you, God? What do you need from me, God? I got your back. Mm. And I say, I honor you. Every morning I tell him that. Wow. He's God of the universe, but I want him to know he can count on me. Mercy. Have you ever thought how that makes God feel? Yeah. Like, let's, let's bring it to reality because I think sometimes the devil comes in and makes us forget that God is a personal God. Yeah. Just how, if somebody comes, he says, listen, I know I can depend on you. Mm -hmm. wow. It makes you feel good when someone lets yeah. you know that they trust you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So every morning I feel like God is like, oh, I can't wait till my daughter wakes up. Yes. And I feel like we have to remember that about God. So I'm, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chris. James 4, 8 says, mm. come near to God and he will come near to you. Mm. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Amen. Amen. When we get closer, yes. Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So we have just these three verses, and there are tons throughout the word of God that give us this comfort that we are never in isolation. As we're waiting for Jesus to come back, even when it gets hard, God is still there with us. And then God also says that he wants us to experience this peace. And I love this also about God. He's not oblivious to our emotions. He's not telling us to suck it up, get over it, He's acknowledging the emotions that we have. Yeah. I know that you're struggling. I know it's hard to wait for me to return. I get it. So let me give you these verses to encourage you in those moments. So experiencing God's peace. I want us now, I'm going to ask um, Justin to go to John 14, verse 27. I'm going to ask LaShawn to go to Philippians 4, 7. And then Dr. Logan, if you would please go to Isaiah 26, verse 3. Talking about the peace God wants us to experience in the midst of this waiting. John 14, verse... 27. 27, all right. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Come on now. Amen. Amen. Philippians 4, verse 7, again in the New Living Translation. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. You will keep in perfect peace yes. him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Amen. Amen. If, yes. if I can add a little plug... What I'm learning about God's peace in the middle of chaos has a lot to do with us just looking at him as a human being that died for us. He's not untouchable. So I, in, in this new season, in the 40s, I am getting well good, acquainted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, glory to his name. I praise God for that. <laughs> I'm getting well acquainted with the spirit of repentance, dying daily and just owning up how raggedy I am and talking to him about it mm. so he can continue to reveal and strip down things that need to be shaped or removed. So when I think about the spirit of peace that he's trying to get me, I see a direct correlation with seeing him as a very present, tangible person. He's so much more personable oftentimes than I think we give him credit for. He's not just on this throne, untouchable. He's, he's right here with us right now, just looking for that conversation to just soothe at times and say, you know, yeah, you messed up that day. Bring it on back. I got you. Let's work through it. But when we don't look at him like that, it, it just makes him so unreachable and so untouchable. But I think if we keep him in focus, 
in proper focus with the right lens, then he really does walk with us. He talks with us and he gives us the perfect peace that we, that he designed for us. Well, Sean, I, um, I like that about you. You're self-reflective and practical. That'll get you to heaven. Amen. Um, Micah, the class of 2004 sent this yes, to you all. Yes. yes, Micah, you better be watching, girl. Because we have heard so long that God is coming back and many have gotten comfortable with the idea of not yet, so therefore the urgency or desperation um, until it's a crisis. Christ is not just Christ of the crisis. That's right. So we get to the point where we put God off. But God never puts us off. That's right. I love going to Sabbath school. I love being involved. People say church is boring or it's not meeting my need. But the question is, I remember Pastor Marshall T. Kelly said, what are you bringing to the table? All right. All right. You're coming through the door looking for something, but what are you adding to the service mm -hmm. besides being a bench warmer? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So don't complain that church is boring. I'm not getting anything out of it. And yet I don't have this urgency to even go to church, but you have an urgency to get to that job go on that date, make that need meet, get to Oakwood, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't have time for that personal care with me. The church cannot run effectively without us being there on Sabbath. So I want to encourage saints who have gotten to the point they've lost their joy or urgency Say to get back with God yes. and, really, and take a good look at your relationship. Really take a good look and that personal touch. And I guarantee you, you'll be at Sabbath school next week. <laughs> <laughs> I love how the, the personal touch of having this relationship with God is coming yeah. out. Because again, when you start getting closer to God, the immediate result is you want to affect someone else. Yeah. It, you want to affect someone else. And I think this is why God is saying, I'm going to give you this perfect peace. Yeah. Because others are watching us. Yeah. We're talking about waiting well. Others are watching us. So if you're going through a struggle, you have a trial, something's happening in your family, but you still look peaceful. Someone's going to ask you, wait a minute, where does that come from? My relationship with the Father, right? So we have to remember that. Go ahead, Chris, yes. I want to share, I don't want us to miss Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall mm. reap in joy. Mm. He who continually goes forth weeping, mm. bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, mm. bringing his sheaves with him. Mm. I've thought a lot about that verse because I started a garden recently. And my niece was visiting me a couple of weeks ago and I asked her, sweetheart, I want you to water, I want you to water the garden, but nothing had come up yet. Mm. She said, I feel like I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, if you carry in your seeds, mm. you're gonna be blessed. You just gotta wait. You got to keep watering. Yeah. You got to sow those seeds of weeping. You, you're going to keep watering, keep waiting. The Lord will bless you. Um, my kale and my cabbage and my broccoli is doing numbers oh, right now. Oh, 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 oh. She couldn't see it when she was there watering. <laughs> but weeks later, it's springing up out of the ground. All right. The Lord is going to be faithful. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, Amen. Time has gone by so fast. Um, so we're going to skip down to Wednesday's lesson just to quickly wrap things up. Because Wednesday's lesson I felt was so powerful, waiting in God's Sabbath rest. And I retitled it, Experiencing God's Rest While We Wait. So very quickly, I, I want to ask this question. And the question is, why do you think vacation time or PTO is so important, right? We all have jobs or had jobs. We know the importance of vacation time and having PTO. Why do you think it's so important to have that vacation time? Why don't we just work 24-7? What are your thoughts? It's really simple. Uh, God said it at creation, mm -hmm. a day of rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's in our biological makeup that we need this rest. Mm -hmm. And he programmed one in every seven days. Come on now. He's reading my notes. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, we need to reboot regroup, and reorganize. Now, the Bible says, six days shall thy labor. People always say to me, Kim, you work six days. I open my practice on Sunday wow. to meet the needs for those who need to come on Sunday. Wow. 
and and the benefits are amazing. Amen. 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 Um, God rewards those who are faithful. Oh Let me God. get a dollar. So when, when people say, I work Monday through Friday, I said, well, we're not keeping the commandments. He says, six days shall thy labor. Uh -oh. But that labor can be within your home. That labor could be anywhere. Yeah. All right. But what I say to you myself is that I had to reboot, regroup, and then I can reestablish my goals on a daily basis. So I take that time. You know, I was just telling Dr. Smith, I'm ready to get my pilot's license. And I need him to make sure I get that done. So I'm going to take that time to do that. And so that I can go out and just fly my plane wherever I want to go and just relax and have that moment. So we need to find things in our lives so that we can, you know, regroup, reboot, and reestablish our goals. You know, there was a time when I was working full time and volunteering with Tuskegee Airmen. And people were wondering, how can you do all of that and teach part-time, you know, on the college level and remain sane. Mm. And then we ask you, what'd you do over the weekend? Well, it took a bunch of kids camping and basketball. When do you ever rest? Mm. And that rest is not to sit and be still. Mm. It's actually just to do something different. Mm. So on Sabbath, I get to do something different and that gives me that refreshing rest so I can attack all the other issues and, and work issues during the week and remain calm. And that's when people were wondering, how do you have that peace? How do you have that calm? How can you accomplish? It's the Sabbath. Amen. 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 I just didn't want to skip over. Um, Dr. Logan mentioned that she would be getting a plane. A class of 2004, do, who has a plane? That, who's going to be a pilot? Because that was a, it was a powerful moment I heard from... Kudos to you, Thank you Dr. Logan. You um, are doing big the, things. The, the, the class of 79. That's right. That's we, right. we fly airplanes. Respect. Wow. Respect. I think the class of 2004 is, is characterized by humility. Um, I just want to continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to read one last verse and then a quote to wrap us up. Um, this is from Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and verse 28. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and verse 28. It says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And again, to summarize quickly, reiterating the fact that God knows we struggle. He knows it's hard for us sometimes to wait for him. He knows that we push, we go, we go. He said, okay, every week though, I need you to reset. I need you to stop and have time with me and rest. So this is something we have to keep in mind so that we wait well. And to wrap up again our panel, I want to read this quote from the lesson. This is from Sunday. It says, waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith, a trust and faith revealed in action, which you alluded to as well, Dr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and peace. It motivates us to work harder, bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields. And last, waiting on the Lord will never put us to shame, but will be rewarded, richly rewarded, because the Lord is faithful to all his promises. So let's wait well, family. Let's wait well. Chris, you want to close with a prayer? I understood we were supposed to have another song, but um, if she's not coming, then let's. Perfect timing. Here. While she's walking, Perfect. Uh, what I'm taking away is who are you waiting with? We're waiting on the Lord, but the Lord is with us while we're waiting on his second coming. And that affects our purpose. That affects our isolation. Everything uh, comes down to who are we waiting with. Amen. Amen. I hear you, Dr. Kelly. Praise God. Even a road trip is better when you got your people with you, you know. <laughs> so maybe we should start to say, hey, Tiffany, the weight looks good on you. Right? Amen. The weight is on you. And I have a motto, <laughs> Tiffany. My new motto is 
you know, live to be well. Yes. Live to be well while you wait on the Lord. Amen. 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 And in that waiting. One of the things that stuck out for me was Hebrews 13.5. It's one of my favorites. Because sometimes when you're going through life, it kind of feels like you're by yourself. But the truth is, just because God is silent, it doesn't mean he's not there. Sometimes the silence, as a parent, I have learned that sometimes that silence is important because my children need to learn how to be in this moment and how to trust that I've got their back, even if they don't fully understand everything that's happening. And that I'm always going to be there, just like how God is always there. We've got to believe, alumni, friends, family, that God is always there. Yes, he is. And he's always able to take care of any and everything that we have. He made us. Sure. He's got us. Yes. Amen. to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He's oh, God is, God is, he's able, God is able to do what he said. fulfill every promise he made to you so don't you give up cause he won't give up on you oh, 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 oh. he's able God is able to do just what he said, said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise he made to you. So don't you give up, because he won't give up on you.
Amen. Yes. Class of 2004. Class of 2004, I like it. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. There's a word to the seed carriers. Don't give up on your seeds. Keep faithfully planting your seeds. God has not forgotten about you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the reminder not to give up. We thank you that you've told us that we wait on the Lord, be of good courage, that you will strengthen our heart. So God, give us strength. Help us to hold on tight. Help us to be faithful to the task to keep planting our seeds, to trust that you will do exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let everyone who believes in the risen Christ say amen. 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 God bless you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Oakwood. My name is Matthew Dormas. And I'm Lizbeth Peguero Pena. And what a blessing Sabbath school was. I really have liked that we were reminded to wait on the Lord. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us for Sabbath School. A verse that I'm reminded of is Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? So often when we're waiting on God, we really try to trust ourselves because we don't really believe that God is for us. And you know, that makes the wait so hard sometimes because of our own human inclination of just instant gratification, as they mentioned. But we can always remember to trust on God because he is the source of our strength. And that's, that's so beautiful. Right. So we have a full day of activities planned. Can you talk to us about that? So today, after our divine service, starting just in a few moments, we're going to have the Vespers and Aeolians concert. We're going to be graced with the wonderful voices of the Aeolians and listen to Paul Graham speak to us once again. Right. And this weekend, we're celebrating... Um, our alumni classes of 04 and 09, I believe. You know what's crazy? We were born in 2004. <laughs> that is actually insane, but it's really wonderful. It's a privilege to be here, born in 04, celebrating the 04s, well, the 4s and the 9s. And you know, right here with me, I have this, which is the newest release of the Oakwood Magazine, which says, much more than enough. Right, so in winter 2024, Oakwood, Mad, Oakwood Mag is going all digital, but you can still find the print copy on your chairs, some of the chairs in the arena, and also online. And also, we want to mention to you alumni.oakwood.edu. There you can find the most accurate schedule of everything that's going on. For example, um, right after this, at the Family Life Center at Oakwood Church, there will be a luncheon, a health and wellness luncheon, if you were to go to that, you had to get the pre-tickets, but also there will be luncheons for 04 and 09 classes, different places on Oakwood's campus. So do remember to go to alumni.oakwood.edu to just figure out what's happening this weekend, what's happening today, what's happening tomorrow, because there's so much more in store for all of us here this weekend. Right. Recently on Thursday, there was the Blue and Gold Gala. And at that um, banquet, basically... It was a, all about raising funds for Oakwood. And so if you would like to give, if you would like to pour into what's happening at Oakwood to our awesome students, then you can go online to alumni.oakwood.edu. And throughout the weekend, there will be many QR codes. Right. Yes. right, so as first-generation Oakwoodites, we are not like all of the <laughs> legacy students who have been here forever and ever. And we touched on this a little bit before, but our Oakwood stories. Yeah, it's really interesting how God, in just a matter of seconds, a matter of a single day, he could turn your plans around. And it's really interesting because it reminds us that even when we're experiencing new things, coming across experiences we never thought we'd come across, we can wait on the Lord. And we have the hope that he will always give us what's best for us, even though we can't really see it in the moment. <laughs> Right, and I heard that Pastor Snell is preaching today, and recently he's been doing a teaching series um, in the construction zone. And I know certainly at Oakwood, I have been in my own construction zone. So what has God been building in your character being at Oakwood as a student? 
You know, I think God has been producing something in me, which is to trust in him. Because it's really easy for us to just fall back on ourselves and say, I've got this. I can do this. I have to do this thing by myself. But we always have to remember that God is really the only one in whom we can fully put our trust because he's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He always has our backs. And he has our best interest at heart. Right. And that reminds me of a verse in 2 Corinthians which says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that really reminds me of our theme for this weekend, which is much more than enough. This school year has been hard for Oakwood students and for the Oakwood community as a whole, but we are reminded that God is much more than enough for me and for you. Absolutely. And in him, we are more than enough as well. But remember to come to our website, alumni.oakwood. Edu to, to see what's going on this weekend and what events you can enjoy. Right. You want to stick around for tomorrow. There's going to be a huge expo on the campus lawn where different businesses and authors and whatnot, they will be having their tables. You want to stick around for the Mr. and Miss Oakwood University pageant tomorrow at 6 p.m. at the MAC. And you also want to be there for the alumni parade, which is happening tomorrow afternoon. So don't go anywhere. We're soon going to transition to Ray and Audrey, who will be leading us into the church service. Um, so we just thank you so much for joining us for Alumni Weekend. And we'd love to see you right here at the Von Braun. But if you're not, enjoy your Sabbath. Hello, my name is Kristen Bird, and this is my Oakwood story. The first time I remember hearing about Oakwood was probably like, the first time I could like conceptualize thought and words because that's all my parents talked about. I always knew that I was coming here, especially since they met here. They both went here and like I'm a fourth generation Okodai. So I knew that this would be the place where I ended up. So I was accepted my junior year of college into the Brewers Welcome Scholars Program. It was it was a dream come true. I, I actually came across a video like right before I was accepted about um, someone sent it to me and it was me in kindergarten saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be a doctor. And to see that, like, like that happened like literally a day before and then to get the call that I was accepted the day after, it, it seemed full circle and I could really just see God's hand in my life. Right before I was supposed to take my MCAT, they say like, you know, take your MCAT, a practice exam, two weeks before you take it. Two weeks before my exam, I was supposed to take it. It went back to my diagnostic score, which was the first MCAT I took like in February, January um, to, to begin studying. I was discouraged, um, but I decided I have to push my MCAT back. That seemed like the best decision. And after guidance and counsel that I received, I knew that that's what I needed to do. The entire duration of the internship I was studying for my MCAT, which was, it was hard because um, my job was a nine to five and I would have to go back um, and study probably another five hours a day. And that was extremely difficult. So that's the, the, the biggest challenge that I had. Um, but I'm happy to say that Despite all of that, I was able to get the exact score that I needed. I, I look back on that and if I had done anything different, I can't say that my path would be the way that it is right now and today. And so for that, I have to say that that is all God, all God. He literally directed my paths. And that's my favorite Bible verse, um, Proverbs 3, verse five and six. Yes, I wanna plan my life out in advance, but I cannot trust if I know my plans. And so sometimes I have to be in the unknown to trust. And so Oakwood has made a huge impact on my life. Um, I would say that the opportunities that um, it has provided me, like the Brewers Welcome Scholars and the friends that I've gained at Oakwood, that I feel like that's been the biggest impact on my life. My parents always talk about it, but I have it for myself now. Those lifelong friends that, you know, will be my kids, aunties and uncles and godparents. Um, yeah, that's, that's how Oakwood has really impacted me.
Oakwood University is nestled in the sprawling foothills of the Tennessee Valley and located in Rocket City, better known as Huntsville, Alabama. We produce innovators, problem solvers, and trailblazers. We transform lives through biblically-based education and instill the power of community in all who walk these halls. We create change makers, litigators, and inspire world leaders. Our graduates are energized by the past, ready for the moment, and equipped for the future. Whether undergraduate or graduate, on campus or online, we have the right program for you. Your future starts here. Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin Adusei Yaboa, and this is my Oku story. So my Oku story started from a musical concert that I was privileged um, to be at, and I was sitting at a section of the auditorium which had a very large fan that was blowing air at my side. So there came these two um, alumni from Oakwood. They um, recommended Oakwood University, the Taylors, George and Devonia Taylor. I didn't know how I was gonna get cleared. So, but it, ju it just happened. I, they made me write some essays, um, applied for some scholarships, and um, I was able to get cleared. There is a sense of divine protection on this campus. And um, when I'm here, I feel like Everything that I put my mind into it is possible because I believe that God is here. My major is in biology and um, of course it's one of the toughest major to be in. The strong um, belief that once you enter Oakwood, that motto that we have that enter to um, learn, depart to serve, if you only have faith, you indeed enter here and, and depart successfully. If you check the statistics of international students who come to the United States and are able to complete their program, it's very less. But if you come to Oakwood and you have faith and you do your work, your chances of completing with less or no depth is very high. All I can rely on is faith to make the heavens work on my behalf. Anything concerning school and concerning my stay here is based on faith because I, I, I believe in talking to God and trusting that he, he, he will hear your prayers and answer it. Everything that I can think of that I prayed well in during my Oakwood time. From the time I made up my mind to come to Oakwood till now, I've seen the Lord's hand in everything that I do. And actually, greatness begins at biology. Good morning, happy Sabbath, happy Oakwood University Alumni Weekend. I'm Audrey Johnson with two of my favorite people. Hi, I'm Raymond King. And I am Janine Lindor. And we are so glad that you all are here. We just had Sabbath school uh, led by some of the honor classes. And man, what a weekend it has been thus far. Uh, we are grateful that you all have tuned in, that you're here in person, and I can't believe 
Ray, we were chuckling uh, that the host before us, the students, they did a right. phenomenal job. Right. I was chuckling. They said they were born in 2004. 2004. <laughs> I, was, I was out of school in 2004. Uh, way out of school. <laughs> in fact, this is my honor year. So oh. very happy. My silver honor year, 25 years, graduated from Oakwood University. Very excited about that. Good to see friends and classmates. Uh, from back in the day. We can say that now, right? So many accomplishments, and it's just good to be able to share um, those accomplishments and what we have been doing since right. we left right. this beautiful campus yes. of Oakwood University. And it's wonderful to think about that. It was just last year that we were all sitting here. A year goes by so fast so quickly and now it's 2024 mm -hmm. and we're here again for Oakwood University's Alumni Weekend. You know what, um, it's, it's always a pleasure when you get to see, I'm gonna say old fresh faces. <laughs> old fresh faces. <laughs> old fresh faces. <laughs> you know, um, you seeing so many people who um, you just remember just not too long ago walking across campus, you had class with them, you ate lunch with them in the calf, mm -hmm. you went to the basketball game and here they are now. And not only are they here, but some of them have brought their children. And their children are students here yes. at the yes. university. That legacy yes. continues. Um, and so it's been beautiful to see that. Both of you are legacy children for Oakwood University. Why are you looking at me like that? Your family <laughs> is a legacy family as well as Jeannie's. You both are. Um, my parents, my dad came here for a little bit, um, but you both are. Tell us a little bit about that experience. And Ray, neither of you have kids here, um, but how does that feel just being and then seeing your friends' children being back here? No, it's amazing. So Oakwood has always been in the DNA. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we had a choice or there was something <laughs> else going on. We had choices, uh, for sure. Right. But this place is special. I remember every single year we would come here. There are so many people that um, my family has met with, integrated. And sometimes you know the saying, um, you, there's family that you have that you're born into, and then there's family that becomes family because of that. And there is something so special about Oakwood. So parents, my parents have gone here. My aunts and uncles have gone here. My cousins have gone here. And hopefully eventually my nieces and my nephews will go here as well. So legacy is definitely one key word that makes a difference in the Oakwood experience. Right. Well, I wanted to continue uh, the tradition in my family. Shout out to the PA family. PA. I had um, big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle Raf, who was South Atlantic Conference president some years ago, mm -hmm. um, had to fill his shoes. And my mother's brother, my uncle David PA, he also came here. Um, he is a pastor um, in the Southeastern Conference. And so it's a pleasure to just know that I continue on their legacy. I had many other family that came, but those are two that just stick out right now for me. Right, I, I'm, I'm laughing that you said your, uh, your uncle David, Ray and I did not know till later. His uncle actually interned at my home church in Florida. Oh, wow. Right, when I was connections, a kid. I know. Connections. It's the legacy right. that just continues to go. So let's talk about this power packed week that we've had. It's now called Alumni Week mm -hmm. and not Alumni mm -hmm. Weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a phenomenal week of yeah. just experiencing Oakwood. Someone told me they've been here since Wednesday. Wow. Um, and so usually everyone rushes in to get to the gala on Thursday, um, but people are coming in earlier. Students are engaging. In fact, even in my in my own personal way, I wore Oakwood gear every day this nice, week. Um, nice. I had to have something on that represented my wonderful alma mater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this Oakwood week, uh, Wednesday, People were starting to come in. Thursday, mm -hmm. the activities started, right? Um, where we were able to have the basketball game and then um, we also had the scholarship gala. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was wonderful. Had a musician, a phenomenal musician who was there and able to honor some of our uh, professors. Dr. Right. Vanterpool mm -hmm. um, was honored and she does such an amazing job she with does. the biology department she and does. she's so invested in her students. So if you think of Oakwood University, if you think of a professor, yeah. mm -hmm. she is one of the ones that you take with you for a lifetime. And yes. so it was nice to see that. Actually, I want to say 
there was some events even before then. I had an mm -hmm. um, honor to attend a health conference. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. right. Um, that Oakwood helped co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, some it alums. Was, yes, nice. yes, with some alums, the Baptiste. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great conference. Um, it's one of the first that's been done here, and it was so encouraging to know that we as Adventists, we as Oakwood Dykes, that we already carry this health message. Um, I had some colleagues that went, and um, there was one particular alumnus that brought some food, some vegan cake, <laughs> shout out Donna Green Goodman, <laughs> and some chicken. Oh. And some let veggie me, chicken. Some veggie, vegan, vegan, vegan chicken. Vegan. Okay. And I think we won over some new people who want wow. to be vegan. And I told them, I said, you know, this is the type of food that I got every day mm -hmm. at Oakwood in the calf. Right. You know, and they was just like, wow, you know, you can eat good and be yeah. vegan? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is the message that not only do we carry at Oakwood, but with the Adventist system. Absolutely. Definitely. And I think one of the things that I enjoy about Alumni Weekend is it brings to light so many things that are going on with the school, going on with alumni, you know, obviously. But just like you said, with the health uh, fair, with all of the scholarship galas, there were over 40 events mm -hmm. planned for this Alumni Week, over 40. 40 events. And one of the things that you want to do is, if you have your program with you, you want to make sure that you check out all of those events in the Oakwood magazine. You want to make sure that it's there. There's something, something for everybody. Mm -hmm. Something literally for everyone. I know my parents, they went to the gala. They enjoyed themselves I saw the there. pictures on Facebook. They enjoyed the themselves. There was yes. also an auction oh. um, that happened there. And like it says on the magazine, there's so much more right. to Oakwood. There's so much more and always more to dive into. So this year's theme is much more than enough. Much more than enough. We're used to hearing I'm enough. Um, but this says to me that everything that you need can be found at Oakwood. Um, and so that's a blessing. The theme and that theme is going and running throughout the entire weekend and just through the fabric of what Oakwood University does. Um, and so as we talk about some of the other events, last night, oh my goodness, right at the Oakwood University Church, we it had Vespers um, with Pastor Michelle Clark. Clark. Clark, yes. From Canada. Yes. From Canada. It yes. was a beautiful service. Um, one of the things that people enjoyed, I heard that they enjoyed about the service last night. They enjoyed the message, but they enjoyed the worship atmosphere. They enjoyed having that Oakwood AY feeling. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. Pastor Michelle Clark did a wonderful job. You Love. know, I remember Pastor Michelle Clark when I was in school, and she worked in the chaplain's office, mm -hmm. and she was one of the chaplain assistants. And, you know, it's always great when you see a face that you recognize that comes up on stage. But you get to see where they start. You know where they started, but see where they are now. Yeah. So it's always a blessing to see that. You know what's really wonderful? I got to connect with some of the students yesterday. You know, after you went to other pastors, um, I did. I was honored to be involved with United Student Movement. Um, and working with United Student Movement, you get to see where our students are are like as students and then to see where they go and how they matriculate through the university. Wow, what a beautiful transformation. And we talk about that here at Oakwood as well, transformation. So when you say that you remember uh, Pastor Clark as a student and now full-fledged pastor and she is doing well and bringing people to Jesus, that's wonderful to hear. Another highlight from last night, of course, was OU Honors. Um, yes. It was yes. wonderful. Lots of good music. It's, that's what we're known for, right? Great right. music. Great. And we're so happy for our honorees that we were able to just applaud, mm -hmm. give them their flowers, mm -hmm. give them their flowers. We had Bryce Davis yes, and yes. Mark Washington, uh -huh. as well as Lois Peters. And My Jesus. <laughs> My Jesus, <laughs> My Jesus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Wentley Phipps. It yes. was a beautiful program, a beautiful program. And each of them, each of the honorees, as they received their awards, I think they were very humbled by the fact that Oakwood would honor them. You know, sometimes it's rough to live a life, you, you enter to learn, you depart to serve, and you come back, and sometimes you want to know if you've made an impact Absolutely. and if you've made a difference. Right. And to see that their life displayed, the videos, the commentary, everything that they've done, mm -hmm. not just for their careers, but how they've given back to Oakwood right. as well, right. it showed so much, and they were so grateful, mm -hmm. but the program overall was beautiful. Right. I, I love that we've always taken the time 
to acknowledge our younger alums. Mm -hmm. um, and so seeing that Bryce was awarded on last night, um, it just does something for us to say, you know, sometimes we wait until uh, later in, in individuals' careers, but to honor them as they are starting their careers and they're making an impact is, is wonderful as well. And I appreciate that the school did that. It's never too late to say thank you. It's right. never too late to say mm -hmm. we appreciate you. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad they're starting that precedent. It was beautiful. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And then across the way, over in Madison, Alabama, right. uh, Jeannie, we love you, but <laughs> Ray and I had to I, do the recon. I had to do the research for today. <laughs> Ray and I are DPers for life. That's right, DP lifers. Uh, so Dynamic Praise is celebrating their 35th 35. anniversary awesome. this wow. weekend. I mean, that is amazing. Talking about students and transformation and impact. Mm -hmm. What an impact. Mm -hmm. 35 years, an organization that began with freshman students who were just passionate about sharing the love of Jesus Christ through music. I know Owen Simons did not think that we were going to be here this 35 long. years this later. Long. And so I'm grateful for that organization. For me, it was one of the things that has literally kept me connected mm -hmm. to Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I have been at actually all of the... <laughs> Reunions? Ooh, I'm dating myself. <laughs> uh, all of the reunions. My freshman year was the fifth one. Wow. And so I'm just grateful. I can't even really put it into words. It was nice seeing you, Ray, in your normal spot, dead center, <laughs> dead in the center. middle. Well, you know, right there. You know, it wouldn't be a DP concert without that. Listen. I don't know why I magically What is the tennis section right without there. Ray? <laughs> but you know, middle. the interesting thing, once again, uh, talking about legacy, there are s singers in the choir now that... We're not born right. Talking when about DP it, started. Yes, and, and it's so, mind blowing. And so the f interesting thing is, is seeing parents sing with, with their, their child. Oh, man. That is such that's an precious. awesome experience. Yeah, yeah. Such that's, an awesome that's experience. That's legacy. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yes. And so speaking of just moving into today, uh, the class, of, I saw a little bit of trickling of a lot of the classes who were doing Sabbath school this morning. Um, once again, seeing those that we walked the halls of Oakwood University with. Um, I love the integration, um, speaking of those who have, you know, their honor year is a right. little ways back, right, and then right, some right. who are just fresh honor year. And so I appreciated the Sabbath school lesson. And the Sabbath school lesson's been good this quarter. I shouldn't say this quarter, <laughs> but it's a good always a good um, vantage point to hear others and how they connect to, to Jesus. Um, and so it was nice seeing that and being a part of that this morning. And then on at 11 o'clock, a That's lot right. of power packed. We start off, we're honoring the fours and the nines mm -hmm. right. um, with much more than enough. I'm excited. Uh, Henry Wright, Pastor Henry Wright, is doing the invocation. That's going to be a Listen, sermon in you, and of itself. If you needed a prayer, <laughs> if you needed a prayer to start off your worship service, Mercy. I'm sure he's going to get one yes. through for right, you. Yes. Right, right, right. So, and then honoring the class of 1999, speaker mm -hmm. director and senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church, speaker director of the Breath, Breath of Light. Life. Uh, TV and ministry. Uh, my classmate, Pastor Dubly Air Snell. So excited to hear um, what he will be speaking about. He is doing, I, I know I've said phenomenal a million times today, but he is doing an outstanding job. Once again, seeing people right there where God has yeah. placed them. And I remember him being um, USM president. He mm -hmm. actually served two years. Um, and when he served, you knew that he had a passion for people and for God during that time. So to see that now 25 years later and being able to celebrate him in this way yeah. is a right. beautiful thing. It's a beautiful right. thing. Right. And one of the things that I appreciate about how Breath of Life is growing and just transcending and moving into different spheres, I was actually in uh, at Bridge Street yesterday mm. uh, with my husband. Which wasn't here. Which was not here. <laughs> it was a which, cotton field. <laughs> listen, so many things have changed. And me and my husband, we saw on one of the ads displayed, we saw Breath of Life displayed awesome. in one of the ads. So it's touching everywhere in Huntsville. Even as Huntsville grows, it's reaching further than 
right where we are. Right. And I think that's one of the key points that we see at Alumni Weekend, how far you've been able to reach mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. outside of Huntsville, where you've gone after graduation, mm -hmm. how your life has changed, how your life right. has been advancing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to in the worship service is also the music. Right. The oh, music. Man. And we're going to be blessed by the Oakwood College, Oakwood University Aeolians, dating right. myself, <laughs> Oakwood University Aeolians. And they're also having a concert tonight, right? Absolutely. Right. right. Yeah. That is the Vespers program. Right. One of the ways we culminate the Sabbath right. every year, uh, and that will be at the Oakwood University Church. Um, Jeremy is... Mercy. <laughs> doing his thing. himself. He is doing the, the thing. Himself. He is doing it. And this is his second full year, mm -hmm. and so we are happy that he is here and that he has really taken Aeolians to his own and they are, um, it's just interesting watching the different directors and how they, right. they uh, move through the choir and how they are able to make it have that same Aeolian sound, but it has a little bit of their and own. it's beautiful. Yes. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love that he added in to the repertoire mm -hmm. are the uh, Mr. Rogers songs. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> and he makes it sound so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I love how he takes it and he interprets it in a way that's very Aeolian. Mm -hmm. Very Aeolian. And he mm -hmm. makes it sound so good. Once again, music that you can't get anywhere else but uh, right. here at Oakwood. Nowhere yes. else. And that concert is actually this evening. It's going to start at 6.15. 6.15 this evening with Sabbath Vespers and the Aeolians concert. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know um, what you all um, came to alumni for. I know this is something that we have done for many, many years. Um, besides seeing your friends and connecting, what are the one of the thing? What are one of the things that you really look forward to going through the Oakwood Alumni Homecoming Weekend? So I don't know about you guys, because you guys live in the area. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Michigan. And so sometimes just coming back to Huntsville, period, it just feels like home. Mm. It's a comfort feeling. And e even as it's growing, even as it's changing, there's so many apartment buildings going up, so many home subdivisions going out. Um, Oakwood is a place where you just feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You just feel comfortable. So even walking through the campus, going through, just memories flood. Right. So as you come back, Alumni Weekend, if you had to put it into one word, it's just memories. 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 Right. What right. would that be for you? Um, you know, just hearing people's stories of where they are now mm -hmm. and seeing how God blessed them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't know where people are going to go once they leave Oakwood University, but when you get a chance to hear their stories and their testimony to see how they're actually doing well out in the world, it's so amazing, you know, seeing how many doctors you're connected to, teachers and lawyers and pastors and entrepreneurs, you know, it's such a blessing to see them and like, wait a minute, that's my mm -hmm, classmate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're doing big. Right. They're doing and it well. And so proud. Right, yeah. right. And just to know that you were a part of that, I'm going to say that, fruit bowl mm -hmm. um, of just opportunity and success. You know, it's so wonderful and a blessing to see. Yeah. Um, my word would be family. Mm. Um, it is such a blessing to just be around. You know, you think about those relationships that are now 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think of those that I was, came as freshmen with and I'm still connected to, Carmen Dr. Carmen Buckner and I came here the same year. And so to know that we're still doing life together, um, you don't get that everywhere. I, don't, I would assume um, that even at a public university, um, not an HBCU, because HBCUs, we're pretty intentional about staying connected. Um, but I would say that we do not get that other places. So to be able to have my friends, family, yeah, um, yeah. my son's calling them aunt and uncle, Uncle Ray, Aunt mm. Jeannie, you know, those are very important to me for just the legacy of the university and just for good life, you know? Mm. So that would be my one word, family, family. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So all of those connections, they make a big difference in how we navigate life. Mm -hmm. And how would you say that your connections with the people that you have now called family, mm -hmm. um, and it's something that's endearing, mm -hmm. and how would you say those connections have made a difference in how you just see your, your view on the world based off of your Oakwood experience? Mm. You know, 
I think a lot of times having a different perspective mm -hmm. or having an expert opinion mm -hmm. on things, knowing that I can call someone mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. get their oh, expert yeah. opinion on something is, is wonderful. And I just think about how many people actually have that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people I can call on if I need to know something dealing with my health. Mm -hmm. And they're going to tell me the give me their best yeah. opinion because they care for me. Based on education. Yeah. Based on education. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Based yeah. on education. Good, so right? just knowing that you have those connections out there is, is, is a wonderful thing. It yeah. is, yeah. yeah. I, I would say, I mean, I love that. Um, I love being able to go almost anywhere mm -hmm. and I get to see my family. Um, you travel, you see family. Um, you, you pick up the phone sometimes and you connect with family you haven't connected with. Um, and sometimes it's not long conversations because you know what you know, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to do that. And then even when family's having hard times, still being able to embrace and love and get through that is also a good thing. It is. And I've heard of different experiences from different people where they were stuck at an airport. Mm -hmm. They looked up somebody on Facebook, who is the nearest mm -hmm. person I can call? And it was an Oquidite. Right. You know, they're sending their children out on a trip. They Absolutely. might be out far. They have a connection at a church. They say, hey, I need you to watch out for my child. Absolutely. And there's a trust factor there mm -hmm. because they say, okay, I know you. I, we've been to school together. I know you'll take care of, you know, who I need you to take care of right. because right. you trust that fact because they're right. an alumnus. Right. I, I think of we, the, one of the first videos, or the first video was Kristen Bird, mm -hmm. soon to be Dr. Dr. Kristen yes. Bird. Yes. And she's in Birmingham area, right? And she has really connected in the church. Ephesus is really good mm -hmm. for taking care of the UAB students, um, the, the students who are going through medical school, who, dental school, who are really, really at a really tough part in their lives, but they're able to connect to that church, and she's really engraced herself with that, and so that has been that family yeah. again, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's been, as you said, we, we get to be connected wherever we are, uh, not just here in the Huntsville area, but globally. So Globally. And yeah. that is so important. So again, we're here celebrating. Much more than enough. Much more than enough. And one of the things that we want to just think about is there's so many classes being honored. Mm -hmm. Uh, their class is being honored for 75 years, the class yes. of 49, 70 years, the wow. class of 54, 65 years, the class of 59, 60 years, 64, and all the way down, coming down to five years, the class of 2019, which you, does not seem like it was that it long ago. Not, it, that was the year before we went into COVID. Marcy. Wow. Mm. The year before we went into COVID. And so it's going to be a very good weekend. It's going to be a high Sabbath, as the good pastors right. would say. A yes. uh, high Sabbath, one that God is really going to show up. We are excited about what Oakwood University is doing and how we are much more than enough. enough. Um, and so I'm excited about what we will be worshiping through and as far as the 11 o'clock, the 615 Dynamic Praise is has an 8 o'clock concert this evening as well. The basketball games are going on this evening after we close the Sabbath. Lots of activities. Uh, right. Lots and then of activities. Uh, tomorrow, they will conclude the basketball games. And so, so much still going on. Mm -hmm. There's the Vendors Mall that will happen. Right. It's in a new location in the center of campus by the statue. Um, and so, make sure that you are able to do that. But we're so grateful that we've had this opportunity to just come back and connect and talk to our Oakwood family about this year's Oakwood University Alumni Weekend. So just want everyone to just gravitate to the word. Um, I know that we're going to receive a blessing. Yes, indeed. I, if you haven't heard Pastor Snell before, you are in for a treat. Absolutely. You are definitely in for a treat. It'll be unforgettable. And if you're watching online and you need access to our schedule of events, you can just go to alumni.oakwood.edu, alumni.oakwood.edu, and you can get the full list of everything that's been going on. So on behalf of Dr. Leslie Pollard, our president and Oakwood University, we welcome you to this 11 o'clock service. Good. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church.
If you love the Lord today, I want you to wave your hands and say, Happy Sabbath, church. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? God has woken you up this morning, not because he had to, but he wanted to. So let's stand on our feet as we give God praise today and welcome his spirit into this place. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say amen. What a marvelous God. What a mighty God. And oh, yes, he is worthy of our praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the book of Psalms, Psalms 96, as we think about the call to worship this morning, the word of God says, sing unto the Lord. Sing praises unto his name. Bless his name. Tell of the glory of his name. Ascribe unto the Lord. Ascribe God and worship him today in spirit and in truth. May God bless you as we lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Our Holy Father, the God who makes planets and carries crosses. We thank you, O Lord, 
that you've been kind enough, sparing enough, to bring us by plane and train and car and bus to this place of worship. It is your house now. We claim Von Braun for you. You've invited us. You have sustained us. You have forgiven us and covered us. And so we stand in your place, grateful and thankful for years of your covering, your goodness, your mercy, your love, your supply. We thank you. And now as we worship today, may your Holy Spirit fill us, hold us, lift us, encourage us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us, or we would not be here. And so we invoke now your presence. We thank you for looking above and beyond our ugliness, covering us with your beauty. And now in the, in the, in the, in the glowing of your goodness, we stand in this place for worship. Hear us, feed us, touch us, hold us, bind us. But most of all, Lord, when you come, save us from ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Let's continue to stand, those who are able, as we sing our morning hymn of praise, Watch Ye Saints.
You may be seated, but if you want to praise God, you can stand on your feet because he is that worthy. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? We're going to do something real quick. So when I say spirit check, I want you to say hallelujah. Spirit check. No, no, no. Let the heavens hear you. Spirit check. Hallelujah. His name is great, and there's power in his name. So as we sing praise and worship, feel free to lift up your hands, stand on your feet, shake somebody's hand, give them love, how God will give you love. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we love to and call your name. It's something we cannot explain.
Spear check! Spear check! Spear check! Spear check! Hallelujah, Jesus! When we call his name, somebody ought to say amen. When you call on the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, something happens. Amen, somebody? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, when I call on the name of the Lord, something happens. Well, I'm David Richardson. I'm your vice president for Student Life and Mission. And I'm so honored today and privileged this morning to bring up our honor students. And when we think about our honor students, we think about those students who are maintaining a GPA of 3.5 and above. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Come on, you can do better than that this morning. Our honor students who are maintaining a GPA of 3.5 and above and is involved in the leadership of our campus. Well, this morning, our honor students, as they make their way up, will come and bring welcomes this morning in behalf of our illustrious and beloved president, Dr. Leslie Nelson Pollard, the 11th president of Oakwood University. Somebody ought to say amen. Come on, somebody ought to say amen. And then they will bring welcome in behalf of our chairman of our board, Elder G. Alex Bryant, the second, come on now, the second African-American president of the North American division ever in the world church. Somebody ought to say amen. Put your hands together for Elder Alex Bryant and uh, President Leslie Nelson Pollard. Now our, our students will come and bring welcome in behalf of, of our president and Elder Bryant. But I want you to know something. When we think about student success and what we're doing today in support of students, Oakwood University provides curricular and co-curricular support and services. Stay with me this morning because I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Oakwood University provides curricular and co-curricular spiritual development and services for the sake of our students and our nation's future. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Are you with me this morning? But the mission of Oakwood University is to transform students through biblical-based education for service to God and humanity. What we do, ladies and gentlemen, is we go out and we change the world. We make a difference in this global world. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that Oakwood University, your school, is making a difference. Once again, put your hands together for our honor students, 3.5 GPA and above, who will bring welcome this morning. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you for your support for students. And as we talk today, everyone, we want you to know one thing, success has an address, Oakwood University. You're going to see that in the student features today because students are what we are here for. And behind me, don't they look wonderful, everyone? I said, don't they look wonderful? These are the honor students of Oakwood University. And I'd like you to stand to acknowledge them. Would you be kind enough, please, to just stand and give them a round of applause? They are led by Professor Marcia Burden. Marcia, raise your hand, please. Professor Marcia Burden, who is an attorney and teaches in our, our history, political science department. And also, brothers and sisters, you should know that we are very grateful to Brother Brandon Dent. Many of you know him from Lake Region, Brother, that Lake Region conference. And he was the first director of the, uh, of the program, and we acknowledge his contributions as well today. Let me just say to you, everyone, that a part of what we are here for as alums is to support our students. Now, let me just show you a few things quickly as the PowerPoint goes up. Why you should be proud of your institution and to help us tell the Oakwood story. Let's see the next slide. Now, this slide always touches me because Ellen White said she's and she said, regarding the school here in Huntsville, I wish to say 
that for the last three years I have been receiving instruction regarding what it should be and, how the, and what those who come here as students are to become. And then this is the statement. All, how much everybody? Come on, I can't hear you. All, she said. How much? All that is done by those connected with this school, whether they be white or black, is to be done with the realization that this is the Lord's institution. Can you put your, together, put your hands together for the fact that this is the Lord's institution? It's not my institution. It's not your institution. It's his institution. And because it's his, it's a precious stewardship. Now, let me just show you. Next slide. Next slide, please. There are many things that we could talk about, but I want to take you to one of the most recent awards that Oakwood University has received. It was received by HBCU Pulse. Next slide. Oakwood University was ranked in 2024 as one of the top 10 HBCUs with the highest earning potential post-graduation. Your little Oakwood. So much to be proud of. Next slide. And these are the students who are driving it academically. They are the points of the spear. They are pushing the institution forward. Next slide. These honor students will welcome you. And today, the welcome will come from Gabriel Morenci, who is from Maryland. He graduated from Tacoma Academy. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the Morenci triplets. Y'all ever seen triplets before? Here we are. Here we are. And all of them are at Oakwood, and all of them, thank you, Marcia, for reminding me, and all of them are in the honors program. Come on up. Come on up. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. My name is Gabriel Morenci. My name is Nathaniel Morenci. And my name is Janelle Morenci. And we are the Morenci Triplets. It is such a blessing to be here. On behalf of our family, the honors program, and Oakwood University, we would just like to welcome you all to this beautiful Sabbath morning. And we would like to thank you for your generous support. Enter to learn, depart to serve. That is our goal, that is our aim, and that is our motto. And with your support, that is not just a dream. That is our reality. So thank you, and have a very blessed Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I am Dr. Marcia Burden Tiggs, and I am from the, one of the best classes to ever grace Oakwood University's presence, the class of 2014. And I am super excited to be with here in this capacity, but I also want to highlight some really important things about the Honors Program Scholars. First, I would like to acknowledge that we will be graduating our first cohort of Honors Program Scholars this year. So the class of 2024 is right behind me. All of these students have completed research. They have held leadership positions. They have held an internship, externship program, and they all have above a 3.5 GPA and are all headed to graduate and professional school. So we can give them a round of applause, our class of 2024. Next, I would also like to bring up Janiah Hines and Julius Mitchell, as well as Gabriel Morancy which you saw earlier. But before I do that, I also want to acknowledge the students behind them. They are our team research honors program scholars for this year. They will be presenting research under the advisement of their professors during our faculty research symposium in April. But I would like to acknowledge Janiah Hines. Janiah Hines is the recent finalist of the Black College Quiz Bowl, which was televised. We also had the pleasure 
And I don't know if this is the first time in Oakwood's history or not, but we had the pleasure of doing a press conference at the Toyota Corporation in Dallas, Texas. So we're really excited. And she is also competing in our Honda, which is our uh, another academic competition as well. And then lastly, before I leave, I would like to acknowledge Julius Mitchell and Gabriel Morenci. They both submitted research that was actually out of thousands, thousands of entries, was submitted and won the presentation for the National Honors College Conference for the Southern Region. And we will be leaving next week to present that. So I want to let you know as alum, as guests, that we are all about academic excellence here at Oakwood University. Thank you. Come on, put your hands together, everybody. This is your Oakwood. Now, the next group of students that you will meet, because we're featuring students, and we're going to ask you to help us support them after we present some data to you that's really impactful. Now, you never guessed who this group is, but this group of students are amazing. This group of students come from, these are Oakwood filmmakers. <laughs> Oakwood University's film and television production program. Now you didn't know this, and I saw Dr. Peters and her husband, we honored them last evening, when we created the Media Center as a state-of-the-art broadcast studio, 11,000 square feet. Little did we imagine that our film and television production program would take off. The Oakwood University Film and Television Production Program has won nearly 34 awards in the last three academic years. Now you can do better than that. Would you stand on your feet, please, for these young people one more time. It is amazing what they have done and what their professors are doing. Their professor, Professor Paulette Gates, has done a wonderful job. Wonderful job, wonderful job working with them. Paulette, come up, say a quick word, and then we have a little film clip to give you a little sample of their work. In my hands, this is just a cell phone. In their hands, this is a state-of-the-art production camera. It's remarkable what this generation is able to do. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. I send before you as a proud alum of Oakwood University, the Department of Communication. And we talk about entering to learn and departing to serve, but it's a pleasure to return to give. Amen. Amen, amen, and I just want to share with you a little bit about my focus as one of the uh, program coordinators for the Department of Communication. My goal is to show our young people that it's okay to look different and to be in the room. And for us, looking different is sometimes we're people of color, and then oftentimes for us, we're people of faith. And so I just want to show them that even though it seems like there's not room at the table, it is our turn to create that. And so I just want to invite Pax, Urban Pax Fordham to share a quick thought with you. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, it's my conviction that our traditions, our cultures, our habits, our prejudices are based on media. Um, the, percep the perception of the black community has changed dynamically since shows like The Jeffersons and The Cosby Show and A Different World came on the screen. We're seen differently. I don't just believe that when you and alumni donate to the scholarships for our students to be a part of our program, you're not just donating to cameras and equipment, which you are, you're donating to making a change. Amen. Our goal is not just to make fun TikToks and fun movies, but carry our traditions, carry our ideals, carry our God first mentality into the broader culture and spread what we have to share into the world and change the world for the better. So we thank you alumni for your donations to our scholarships and our contributions and everything you do. Much thanks. Amen. 
Come on, you can do better than that, everyone. Come on, you can do better than that. And I think there's a little bit of a film clip to give you. Oh, there it is. Never try. You have to fail. You got to get it wrong to get it right. I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to fall back on. If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything. Have you ever wondered or dreamed of what it would be like to live in a body that's truly your own? The length that you would go to to become who you always meant to be? Wow. Wow. That's a teaser. <laughs> wow. God be praised. Come on, let's give him a big hand, everybody, one more time. And your Oakwood continues to reach out into various communities. You're going to stay on stage, please, and join this group. Your, your Oakwood community continues to reach out as we feature our students. And so you've seen our filmmakers, but guess what? We have students from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And here they come. From 1896, with 16 African-American students, to a campus now where we have more than 50-plus nations represented on the campus between the workforce and the student body. Come on, put your hands together. And the next slide, please. All the flags represent the tremendous diversity that works at this campus. Remember what Ellen White said. She said, all that is done by those connected with this institution, whether they be white or black, you didn't hear me. It was always a combined effort for the support of Oakwood University. Today, we have students from every walk of life, and we are, as a community, the richer for having them with us. Can you say amen? Okay, now that was kind of weak. You see, my premise about Oakwood is it's a positive premise. When we put on the potluck, we believe that our dishes are just as good as anyone else's dishes that are brought to the potluck. And we want you to taste what it's like to be a part of our community so that you can go out and carry Did you know that your Oakwood University has graduated and they have been hired in the North American Division? 25 Latino pastors who have graduated from Oakwood University. Did you know that? Did you know that? In the regional work and beyond, they're taking the Oakwood message to various communities. And so, it's not all about Latinos, however. Jamina, would you come forward, please? With them is, with, with the group is Elder Isaac Ibarra, a two-time graduate of Oakwood University. Isaac, would you raise your hand, please? Where is he? Oh, there he is. There's Isaac. Isaac Isaac, Isaac, he's doing a tremendous job, everyone. Meet Jamina. She will welcome you and thank you for your support because your support closes a gap that we'll say a little bit more about right before the offering. Bonjour and happy Sabbath. So I am Jemina Luis Ferdinand, and I have the honor of serving as a USM Senator for Diversity and Inclusion. Yeah. <laughs> and I would like to share a Bible scripture with you, which is in Revelation 7, verse 9 to 12, but I will do it in French. So, après cela, je regardais encore et j'avais une foule immense de gens que personne ne pouvait compter. C'était des gens de toute nation, de toute tribu, de tout peuple, de toute langue. Ils se tenaient devant le trône et devant l'agneau, vêtus de robes blanches et avec des palmes à la main. Ils criaient avec force, le salut vient de notre Dieu qui siège sur le trône et de l'agneau. Tous les anges se tenaient autour du trône, des anciens et des quatre êtres vivants. Ils se jetèrent le visage contre terre devant le trône et ils adorèrent Dieu en disant 
Amen. Oui, la louange, la gloire, la sagesse, la reconnaissance, l'honneur, la puissance et la force sont à notre Dieu pour toujours. Amen. So yes, we are from every nation, we are from every tribe, and we speak so many languages. And we are standing here in front of God, but as in front of you, to represent this wonderful diversity that we have at Oakwood. And we are so proud to be Oakwood students because it is really a um, university that values diversity and inclusion. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. So, Dr. Ron Smith, the president of the Southern Union will offer a special prayer for these our dear students and all of our student body, one of the most diverse unions in our North American division. We've asked him to please offer a special prayer of consecration for our students. Students, let's come closer, please. Let us pray. In a culture, of oh God, where we quest to live in our own silos and comfort zones, how refreshing it is today to be exposed to an administration, a campus that is proximate to your divine will in its, in its determination to reach every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We celebrate the fine commitment to ministry of Elder Isaac Ibarra, Dr. Leslie Pollard, and his administration. And certainly, O oh Lord, we offer prayer for the initiative to harness and corral students from around the world. Indeed, we are inspired today by the commitment to expand the horizons of Oakwood University and to extend its reach. Now, O oh God, I pray that you will provide the necessary resources for our international students, that we will pave the way for others to join and matriculate through Oakwood University as well. We thank you, O oh God, for this moment, for what it represents. We celebrate in this world of men and women who are impervious to other. We want to grow in grace with cultural competency according to your divine specifications. So Lord, again, we thank you for international students. We thank you for the initiative to accommodate international students. And we pray your blessing now upon those who lead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's give them a big hand again, everyone. May God bless you. May continue to bless the expansive reach of Oakwood University. Now, as they are exiting the stage, we also have a group of students, uh, recent students, I shouldn't even say recent, alums. Many of them have graduated within 10 years. That's recent when you went to Oakwood College, right? Uh, any Oakwood College people here? Anybody here went to Oakwood College? Come on. All all the Oakwood College people, please stand. All the Oakwood College people, come on. All right, all right, all right. All right, students, see these people? These are the people with the resources. <laughs> these are the people right here. Amen, 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 amen. So let me just say to you, everyone, as we do this work, we celebrate our young alumni, especially recent alumni, those who are 40 under 40. And so we want to bring them up now. Let's put our hands together. They are doing tremendous things, 40 under 40. Emil, would you come up and say something about 40 under 40? And then we're going to have a word from Dr. Bryant. And then Dr. Jules is going to offer a special prayer for these dear and exceptional alums. When you think of the next generation, this is not the next generation. This is the generation that we want to begin to celebrate in a big way. One of the big initiatives you have seen for the last two or three years, 30 under 30 and now 40 under 40. It's a beautiful theme to see 
the success and how God is blessing early in their careers. We celebrate them today. And when you see them on campus, give them encouragement. Keep on doing that Oakwood thing. There are gift bags for each of them, and uh, congratulations. Thank you for what you're doing, how you represent your alma mater so very, very well. I didn't get a chance to see everybody, but congratulations. Let's put our hands together one more time, more robustly this time. Let's put our hands together, and thank you. Elder Bryant, would you come forward, please? And then Dr. Jules is going to offer a special prayer for them. been asked to share a little bit about my story, Oakwood. Each of us has a story and been impacted. I think about Oakwood and when it was established in 1896 and what was going on in our society, uh, the debate on separate but equal in the Plessy versus Ferguson case had been decided. But God knew that that moment was coming. And so in 1891, he impressed Ellen White that we need a place like Oakwood for this people. And we all have been blessed because of Oakwood. When I came to Oakwood, I had become an Adventist at the age of 15. My mother and my father, my mother had a 10th grade education, my father had a 6th grade education, and college or university life was not in my future. But the members of the Northside 7th Adventist Church in St. Louis said, you need to go to Oakwood. I said, what's Oakwood? And they sent me down here, and my life was transformed. When I came to Oakwood, I had a lack of confidence. I had a stuttering problem, especially when I get, had to get up in front of people. I would stutter. And at Oakwood, through the faculty, Elder Henry Wright and Elder Benjamin Reeves and Elder Dr. Rock and so many others who poured into me, Elder E.E. E. Cleveland, they saw something in me that they wanted to nurture. And they gave me opportunity for leadership here on the campus. Actually, they sent me over to Japan as a student missionary. And the assignment was I had to stand in front of people and teach them professional Japanese conversational English. And I taught the vice president of Sony, the vice president of Toyota, the vice president of Datsun Nissan at that time, the vice president of Panasonic. And as I look back on it, I wish I would have kept their contact because I needed a car when I graduated from Oakwood. But, but what Oakwood had placed in me started to bear fruit there. And when I finished that and I came back, I, I didn't stutter anymore in front of crowds. Oakwood continued to pour into me and in leadership and asked me to lead MV. And it continued to pour into me. And Elder Cleveland had this saying that I've seen God do so much with so little for so long that I believe now he can do anything with nothing, meaning me. I drank the Kool-Aid at Oakwood. When we sang Footprints of Jesus, I drank the Kool-Aid. When we sang, the blood will never lose its power, I drank the Kool-Aid. When we sang, it takes everything to serve the Lord, I drank the Kool-Aid. And I believe that with God, anything is, is possible. And now as a result, I go all over the world speaking to thousands. I speak to global leaders. I'll be in New Guinea in two or three weeks speaking to thousands because I was transformed at this place called Oakwood. And God is doing that over and over again in the lives of so many. That's why 
I have to do all that I can so that those who, who are coming behind us, they can have that same opportunity for transformation. And we're hearing the stories. We heard them last night. And we need to prepare the way so those stories can continue generation after generation until the Lord comes. And later on in the program, we're going to be asking you how we all can come together to make sure that those who come behind us can have the experiences that God has blessed us with. And so they, when they come to Oakwood, they can have the opportunity of drinking the Kool-Aid and becoming all that God wants them to be. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Bryan, for sharing your story, which can be multiplied a thousand times over. Whatever little we have become in this world, it is because of Jesus and Oakwood. I invite you now to bow your heads with me as we pray in consecration. We thank you, our sovereign God, for this day that you have gifted to us. Thank you for this weekend as we reflect on your resurrection from the dead and your promise that all things are made possible if we only believe. Thank you, O God, for our dear Oakwood and its role in shaping our lives for service to the wider world. Thank you for these men and women, 40 under 40, who we celebrate for their remarkable achievements in their respective vocation. We recognize that before they were in their mother's womb, you designed them for a divine purpose and life's calling. Thank you for honoring them with gifts and opportunities for self-improvement and an education that has as its foundation a focus not only for this life but for the life to come. Thank you for depositing in each of them desire, discipline, and dedication to excel in their respective fields and for the honor bestowed on them today. We pray in consecration that they may continue to honor you in their lives, that they will embrace fully the teachings of Scripture, that all good gifts come from above, and that every gift given to us has been given to us on consignment. And yes, we ought to be conduits of your amazing love and grace. Bless them, we pray, with long life. Bless them with abundant health. Bless them in their going out and in their coming in. Bless them with a godly purpose and a life-changing passion for what is right and pleasing in your sight. Grant them your divine presence and peace. Crown their lives with continued success. Expand their territory. Multiply their influence. And make them to reflect your divine image in this dark world of sin. Your eternal promise is, if we are faithful, you'll grant to each of us a crown of life. May each one of these, your children, Receive that eternal reward for having lived meaningful lives of service to a world living under the very curse of sin. May they be indeed light in the dark places. Dear Lord, hasten that day when our faith shall be sight and we shall be with you throughout the eons of eternity. In the name of Jesus we pray, with joy abundant and thanksgiving, let everyone say amen.
thank you, thank you, thank you very much. 40 under 40. <clears throat> we want to acknowledge just quickly before we do our roll calls, we want to acknowledge just quickly some persons who have come from the farthest distances to be here at their alumni, uh, at their alumni weekend. Dr. Zumalo came all the way from South Africa. She's a graduate of Oakwood in the 80s. Where is she? Is she around somewhere? I don't see. I saw her somewhere. She's with the Matthews, Doctors Calvin and Belvia Matthews. Where is she? Somebody see her? There. Okay, so there she is. Look that way, everybody. There she, please remain standing. Yes. Come on, wave like a queen, Dr. Zamalo. <laughs> there she is. Welcome home. Welcome home. We, we met her in February back in South Africa. And thank you for the book that you've published on the pillars of joy in marriage. And then we also have Dr. Lachelle Adderley, who is a graduate of Oakwood University. And I'm told that she is the president of the Senate in the Bahamas. There she is. OK, everybody, let's see her. An Oakwood graduate. Our people are everywhere, are they not? Our people are everywhere. So we're going to move this along a little bit, everyone. Recently, um, we contracted with a company to assist us on technology. You guys are going to start making it to the stage. I want you to see them because the work that they are doing, this, is, this company is called Elusian. And Elusian is owned by Mr. Robert Smith. Many of you know of him. Um, Elusian is a powerful high-tech supplier and all of our technology is being managed. Now we've got a lot of work to do on technology but you need to see these persons because they make such a difference on the campus. Our chief technology officer is Mr. Carlin. There he is, Carlin Alford. He's from Lake Region. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> you should have heard him. He said, all day, all day. Yeah, he's from Lake Region, Niles. Not in here all day. I see. Okay, so he's from Lake Region, but we're glad that he's here. I saw his mommy last night, Karen. And uh, Carlin, just introduce a little bit about what the team does. And we're going to keep it tight, but introduce him. So, first of all, I want to thank you for creating this position. I am the first Chief Technology Officer at Oakwood University. And with us we have Elucian, which is a world-class organization in technology specializing in higher ed. Understanding that we needed to make this investment in order to recover, restore, and eventually replace our, in our infrastructure for technology. Behind us we have some of the finest people that Elucian could provide including Chief Information Officer Richard Maxwell. The reason why I say his name, we stole him from Alabama A&M University. <laughs> so if you're from A&M, you're a little upset right now, but God will, God will get the glory. We need you all to understand something. This train called Oakwood University needs gas. It needs fuel. It's going somewhere, and where it is going is the place that's called the end. Turn to your neighbor and say, the end. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then, come on church people, and then, but how are we going to get there? Ellen White says that an army rightly trained and equipped will finish the work. It's not me. It's not you. It's not even the people behind me. It's the students. We must equip them, and it takes tools. Those tools cost money. It's not free. The, the screens, the, the, even the electricity, nothing runs without fuel. Will you pray? And then will you give? Will you pray? And will you give? Because it's the young people that will finish this work. And if I have a secret to tell, I'm tired. 
I want to see my father again. We've lost so many people. Dr. Reeves, Bradford, T. Marshall Kelly. I want to go home. And the young people are the ones to finish this work. They deserve Wi-Fi. They deserve Wi-Fi. They deserve to be able to log on and take their quizzes online. Do you know they have internet in the jungle? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come via the internet. Thank you, everybody. You can see why we're so excited.
and the cherubims and the seraphims, we sing holy. better than that. 35 years of DP they're celebrating. Hallelujah. 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 Just a few housekeeping. Those who received the program, it actually has us saying it's, it's, it, that we're going to be at Von Braun for Sabbath Vespers. That's a correction. We will be at OUC for Sabbath Vesp Vespers. So make that note. Another housekeeping, I want to welcome, I want to give this opportunity to welcome all our alums. This year, last year was first generation. This year, we're celebrating all the Oakwood alumni authors and writers. If you are a writer, alum, and have authored a book, please let us acknowledge you and celebrate you by standing. Let's see all our authors in the house. They are the writers and the authors. Celebrate them. Hallelujah. The masters of word. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the year of the author. They will be selling their books on Sunday. This is a, a plug. All right. Before we do roll call, we need to celebrate the classes of the fours and nines in their giving year giving. All right. So we had a record break, breaking celebration that here. Just know that this is a combination total of their reunion year only. They have broken the record for all time combined. From, they robbed it from the ones and the sixes this year. They, 197 of our honor years of the fours and nines gave a total of $148,000. Give them a big hand clap. Hallelujah for your giving to your alma mater. Now, the top three classes, curious minds want to know. The number one giving class in their reunion year, that clock started the day after last homecoming, a total with a total of $41,043, the class of 1974. Give them a big hand clap under the leadership of Charles Battle. Hallelujah. The number two class in giving in their reunion year with a total of $39,458, the class of 1979, give them a big hand clap. Oh my, oh my, oh my. In our third top giving class in their reunion year, uh, with a total of $20,353, the class of 2004, give them a big hand clap. Yes, there they are, little energy there. We want to congratulate them. Now we're going to do roll call. We must, 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 must do roll call. Praise the Lord, everybody. I have the uh, awesome opportunity to be your alumni council president. And so... Uh, I am excited about where we're going, but I'm also excited about where we came from. That's right. um, in this, I just wanted to just share with you before we do roll call that um, dynamic praise, listening to them, man, watching your daughter. I just wanted to share with you just for those who, why I'm so excited about watching them is because it was 35 years ago Come on. at Cunningham Hall in my room where we came up with the idea for dynamic praise. And, um, and, 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 and a legacy started in a room, like your legacy starts here. And so we want to just simply say, this is the time where you can act up 
I mean, I mean, um, yeah, get excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so when we call your your year, yes. if you can stand and if you can shout and <laughs> see, I got to start the year from class of 49. So if you could just, <laughs> you know, that's good, too. So in light of that, for those celebrating 75 years, class of 1949, if you can stand on Halloween, there we go, there we go. Put your hands together, everybody. Celebrating 75 years. Celebrating 70 years, the class of 1954. Give them a hand clap. Woo! Class celebrating 65 years, the class of 1959. Woo. The class celebrating 60 years, the class of 1964. Woo. Wow. I'm still scared of that class, boy. That's a bad class. <laughs> Celebrating 55 years, class, I'm sorry, yes, class of 1969. Woo! All right, now, our golden class, celebrating 50 years, the class of 1974! Oh, oh, and by the way, by the way, yeah, they reached that goal. That was over 50,000 right there. Give them another hand clap. I'm a little jealous on that one, boy. <laughs> class celebrating 45 years, class of 1979. Celebrating 40 years, the class of 1984. Uh, <laughs> Y'all should be retired. What's that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> class celebrating 35 years. That's when I was just coming in. 1989. Darvell. Darvell. Let me give a special note to a special gentleman oh, yeah. from Atlanta. You know what? All those that are not here, come on. He came on a stretcher. He had a stroke about, I don't know, 15 years ago. Arnett Johnson is in the house. He's from the class of 89. Give him a celebration. He's here. He's right there. He's right there. Hallelujah, Arnett. I just want to take a little time to spend on this year. Uh, what happened? What happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, oh, it's 94, right? Yeah, yeah that's me. Let that's me. That, that's you? That's me. That ain't me? But, but yeah. No, no, that, wait, wait. I just did 89? Okay, okay. Oh, no, oh, you, oh, you got 84? Yeah, you got yeah. my year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, so you got it. You got it. Do it, do it, do it. 1994. Y'all got a different shout out. Oh, oh! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you can, I'm sorry. We can switch up. We can yeah, switch yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Celebrating 25 years, our silver class, 1999. I love this. I love this. I love this. Celebrating 20 years, class of 2004. Celebrating 50 years, the class of 2009. Woo. There they are, there they are. Nine is there. Enter to learn. <laughs> Depart not to swerve. All right, here we go. Oh, careful, careful, careful. Celebrating 10 years. Class of 2014. Oh, there they are. 
and the final class celebrating five years, the class of 2019. There they are, there they are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah for you. So ladies and gentlemen, alums, we come to the point in the program where we have the ability to make someone's burden lighter. <clears throat> I just want to show you a few things, though, to set a context for why we're going in this direction. So let me just pull this up on my phone. OK. As we have toured the country, there's a question that comes to us all the time. And we've done a number of Oakwood Comes to You events through the years. And the question is always, what can I do to support my institution? Let me suggest to you that a part of our support is better informed and better driven if you'd allow me just for a moment to share with you some of the realities that industry, the industry of higher education actually faces. So now I've got it, here it is. Uh, let me just say to you, and, and, and this is meant for us to have an informed approach to how we direct our support to students. Someone said an informed people are easy to lead and impossible to enslave. So let's look at the industry called higher education, which Oakwood sits in the middle of. So let me just go to the next one. Let's go, slide. So when you talk about higher education, this is the environment in which we are working. If you go to the last bullet, I know it's small and it's hard to see, mine is much bigger here on my phone. There has been a drop of three million students in the last decade, three million available students to all higher education. It means then that everyone is fighting for the same students. Now HBCUs, next slide, are in an even bigger fight because HBCU endowments tend to be extremely small. Now why is that important? Because that endowment is really your wealth quotient. How much you have in your endowment is a wealth quotient. Some of the elites with 50 and 100 billion dollar endowments could decide tomorrow that they just won't charge tuition because the interest that will roll off of the endowment will keep the institution functioning ad infinitum. We recently, I recently attended an HBCU conference. I serve as secretary for the UNCF President's Council. I'm the third longest serving president in the UNCF. Let me suggest to you that in one of the days we had, we had a very important presentation. In that presentation, it was shown the endowments. 10 of our 37 UNCF schools have endowments of less than $1 million. 20 of them have less than $2 million. Our current endowment is about $17 million. But that's not enough. We've got to get to a point where we can roll interest off of the endowment, and you hear some of that. So let me just go to the next slide. Next slide. What you're looking at is the funnel of Adventist, uh, the funnel of higher education and where Oakwood sits. And as you come down that funnel from publics to privates to, to for-profits to Christian to Seventh-day Adventist, to HBCU, when you get down to the very smallest part of that funnel, there you see that's where Oakwood sits. There's only one Seventh-day Adventist HBCU, and that is Oakwood. That's a blessing, but it also represents an opportunity. It means that this is a precious stewardship. So let me just show you something that we are dealing with, and it's all based on data. Very quickly, and then we're going to go to our offering. When you look at Adventist higher education, I've done this slide in many places, and it's eye-opening. 
The great heyday for Adventist education was around 2010, 2011, when all of our schools had peak enrollments. Since that time, there has been a steady decline in enrollment in Adventist higher education. But that's also true for academies. That's also true for elementaries. So here in North America, we've got some real work to do around education. Now let me just share with you some of the ways this impacts our institution. Next slide. This is student attrition data, and I want you to take away one number from this. Next slide. Every year between 2019 and 2023, when you add up the years, we have lost approximately 900 students who either stopped out or dropped out. I'd like to thank Dr. Prudence and her team for originally gathering all this data for a grant application that was funded for a million dollars for us to begin to transform the way we do this work. But I want you to stop and to think every year we've lost somewhere between 150 to 200 students who could not for financial or health or other personal reasons, mostly financial, could not continue their matriculation through Oakwood. Now I'm gonna just zip through these slides very quickly and come to where we need to be. Okay, this gives you some sense again. As we look at this data, these are the places where we are making these decisions, right? Younger students are stopping out at higher rates than older students, and there are lots of reasons for that. Next slide. Next slide, just go on. Okay, now you can't read all of this because it's tight, but the predictions are, so I asked our resident statistician in institutional effectiveness, give me some statistical predictions based on the past of what we can expect in 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027. And those numbers are holding true, somewhere around 175 to 200 students are predicted to drop out and stop out in the coming years. Unless, unless we stand in the gap. Next slide. Next slide. So your support is needed. If we fix this, we fix enrollment. Imagine if we had retained 450 of those students where we would be with our enrollment, somewhere around 17, 1,800 students, if we had kept just half of those students. Imagine what it would do for retention. Imagine what it does for graduation rates, all the metrics that higher education is evaluated on. Now the next slide. I present this slide because this is the word of the prophet. And this is what she says. When I look at higher education as an industry, because that's what we in administration have to make our decisions based upon. When I look at it as an industry, if I chose to, I could despair until I read this. Mrs. Ellen White says, take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has he not invited you to come unto him? Never, watch this everybody, what did she say? Come on, I, I need your attention now. She said, never. What did she say? Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. Where's our preacher from last week? Pastor Debley S. Snell preached on the book of Nehemiah, and I tell you, I've been preaching a lot of years. It was one of the greatest sermons I ever heard. You should listen to it. His sermon was entitled, Get out of the comment section. Anybody heard it? Anybody heard it last week? Get out of the comment section. That's the worst place in the world to get your information about anything. Get out of the comment section. She said, never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. By looking at appearances alone and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you give evidence of a sickly, enfeebled faith. Now, this is our line. 
on the campus, we've been celebrating this single sentence in our worships, in our devotionals, in our comments to each other. Talk and act as if your faith was invincible. Get out of the comment section and talk and act as if your faith was, what's that word, everybody? Your faith, see, the, the, the spiritual principle is you rise or fall to the level of your confession. That's the spiritual principle. So brothers and sisters, talk and act. So it's not just what we say, it's what we do. I've had our finance people calculate how much we will need to stand in the gap on the average of what it takes to retain a student who has done everything that they could do. And this is the number that they have come up with. Next slide. On an annual basis. That's not a big number, colleagues. Together, we could do that number today. That's not a big number. To backstop students who are slipping through the cracks. That means we need to get our endowment to about $40 million so that we can roll interest off to help stand in the gap. Next slide. There they are college students trying to scale the mountain. Who will help them? They can't do it on their own. But we can stand in the gap. And so, when we talk about this, we discuss this at our Board of Trustees. And so, Dr. Bryant, if you would come forward on behalf of our Board of Trustees and as an alum of Oakwood, aren't you blessed by the leadership that Elder Bryant provides to the North American Division? I certainly am, everybody. We've been around since 1844. That's 100 plus some years, 50, 60, 70 some years. There have only been two African Americans who've been the president of the North American Division. And we are standing, both of them were alums of Oakwood University, Elder Charles Bradford, may he rest in peace, and Dr. Alex Bryant. Dr. Bryant, talk to us, please. The numbers are staggering. Uh, when I saw this presentation for the first time and saw 900 students over a four or five year period of time who could have been here but were not here because of finances. It, it broke my heart. But when I looked at it in the context of the larger Adventist family in North America, you know, I shared with you early in 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision was made and it instilled and made law separate but equal which meant there were places that we could not attend. There were schools that we could not attend. There were hospitals that we could not attend. And that was true even in the Adventist family when the Lord raised up Oakwood for the colored people, for the Negro people, for the African-American people. And Oakwood still has a place that God has designed for it to occupy in the lives of our students today. And God foresaw what was going to take place in 1896, and he knew we need Oakwood then, and God has foreseen what will be taking place in our society today, and we still need Oakwood. In a society where, in some places, 
They're saying it's against the law to teach black history. It's against the law to teach slavery. It's against the law to teach the Jim Crow laws. That's our history. That's our history. And the servant of the Lord says, we have nothing to fear for the future lest we forget how God has led us in the past. But if we don't even know our history, then how can we know what God has promised for us in the future? Oakwood still provides that place in the North American division. The statistics that we look at, we no longer have a majority ethnic group of any kind. The North American division right now is about 38% Caucasian, 34% people of African descent, 22% people of Hispanic descent, and about another 8 to 9% of others. And the pool of potential students at all levels, elementary, academy, and college university levels, that pool has been shrinking for years. In places that we can no, at one time we could not go, those places now are looking for our students because the pool has gotten so small that we're competing among ourselves. And where our sister Adventist institutions are competing with us is in the area of scholarships to draw students to their campuses. And today, we want to make an appeal that we provide scholarships for students to stay right here at Oakwood, to come to Oakwood. The Board of Trustees has fully and completely embraced the standing in the gap scholarship emphasis for the next several years. And we're here today to invite you to join us. No matter what our differences are, we know Oakwood makes a difference in the lives of students because it has made a difference in our lives. And we want to give the students that opportunity. We want to stand in the gap for them. And we want to invite you to do that. Uh, when I was a pastor, anytime I ask the congregation to do anything, I try to lead by example. And today we want to lead by example. This is my wife. I found her at Oakwood, another, another benefit of this place. I found her standing in the cafeteria of, of Blake Center with a trench coat on, collar turned up, waist pulled tight around, belt pulled tight around the waist with three inch heels. And the Lord said, that's the one. Good morning. The youngest of three girls raised by a single mom, we were very poor. But God gave our mom many years ago, Isaiah 54, 13, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Going in faith to register always lacking. It was a struggle. It was a struggle. It was a sacrifice. But God always made a way. There were family members and friends who would drop a few dollars here and there in our hands to assist us. Some small amounts, others large. But they stood in the gap for us. Mom used to say Christian education doesn't cost, it pays. But I didn't understand that. I'm like, what? It costs and it pays. And she would rebut, no, Christian education doesn't cost, it pays. But later in my adult years, what I came to understand was that the pay outweighs the cost. My two sisters and I are all 16-year products of Adventist Christian education. And we're all graduates of Oakwood not only with our BS, but with our MRS. As my husband said, we found our husbands here, all three of whom God called to be ministers 
and have been called to serve at every level of the church, conference, union, division, and the general conference. Whether you are a student, a parent, or grandparent who has a gap, or you have chosen to stand in the gap, investing in time and eternity, Philippians 4.19 says, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. God will provide. That's why my husband and I have chosen to stand in the gap, not because of our wealth, but because our Heavenly Father is rich and our mom's investment. And there were many who stood in the gap for us. No matter the sacrificial amount you give, you're investing not only in time, but in eternity. God bless you. So this is my wife, <laughs> Prudence. And we met here at Oakwood University as well. Uh, we met in Carter Hall. She was dating someone else. But the Lord showed me, press, that he wasn't for her. And my job was to deliver her. <laughs> and uh, I say that jokingly. And uh, we've been married 44 years, 44 years. Let me tell you my quick story, and then she will share hers. It's 1978, Oakwood College, young president was leading the campus. We loved him, Dr. Calvin Rock. Anybody remember Dr. Rock? Any of Dr. Rock's graduates here? Please let him know that we called his name in reverence and respect. So I go to his office to say goodbye because I'm in my spring semester, I've run out of money. Now my mother told me four years earlier when she gave me $501 bills wrapped in a rubber band, she said, son, if I had more, I would give you more, but God will give you the rest. Well, that was all she could do on her janitor's salary of $2.75 an hour. I get to the fourth year, I worked and I did all those other things, evangelistic meetings, tent meetings, just literature evangelism, all of that. I get to spring quarter, anybody remember the quarter system? <laughs> There's no money. I go to say goodbye to Dr. Rock and I'm sitting on his couch and he said, I heard you're leaving. I said, yes sir, I don't, I'm in my last quarter but I don't, I don't have the money to register. And, and I didn't know to ask anybody, so he said to me, he said, so what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to work, and then I'm going to come back. And I didn't understand it then, but I'm older now. He looked at me, and he paused, and he said, but you might not make it back. And he took out a sheet of paper, and he wrote a note, and he said, take this note to Mr. Hampton. Anybody remember Mr. Hampton? <laughs> take this to Mr. Hampton. And it was a scholarship. I think it was $400. It was a scholarship. And I was able to graduate. And then, of course, God blessed the rest. I'm very grateful. I will always remember what he did. My wife has a similar story. Our children, our daughters, Kristen, Pollard, Kill, our younger daughter, Karen Elise Smith, do not have our story. When we sent them to Oakwood University, we told them that they did not need to fill out a FAFSA. We were contacted by student accounts and said, your daughters have not completed an application for financial aid. We said they do not need to complete an application for financial aid. We write checks to pay for their full tuition, room, and boarding. 
They do not need financial aid, whether federal or university aid. In fact, during the time that our daughters matriculated here at the great Oakwood University, we not only sent a check for each daughter's tuition, room, and board. We sent another check for another student. That was our way of giving back to Oakwood University for what it did for us. You see, I transferred to Oakwood University in 1974. I transferred from a university where I did not have to pay tuition. I was at Bronx Community College in New York, in the Bronx. But when my friend, Pamela Clark and Tony Clark, told me about a place called Oakwood University, Oakwood College, they said, at Oakwood, you get to learn about God. And they took me to a bookstore where they were selling Bibles. And they bought me a Bible and said, when you go to Oakwood, you will learn about the Bible. And then there's a lady, I must call their names, those who stood in the gap. There was a lady, she lives in New York. She is probably listening. She was born in Birmingham. Dorothy Jones and her husband, Cornell Jones. The City Tabernacle Seventh-day Adventist Church in Manhattan. She filled out an application for Oakwood University. And she said, Prudence, you must transfer from Bronx community. You must go to Oakwood University. I didn't understand Dorothy Jones when she said that. But I was an obedient young girl. And I said, there must be something there. I went home and I told my mom, and she said, absolutely not. You are not going south. Our family had had much experience coming through the South. Most recently was my aunt coming through the South. And she said, no. Here's another name you must remember. Pop Willis. J.P. Willis, Pastor J.P. Willis, James P. Willis. You know him. He used to do roll call here every alumni weekend. It took Pastor Willis going to my home and sitting with my mother and convincing her that I must go to Oakwood University, Oakwood College. And then there are two other names. Because you see, when I transferred, from Bronx Community College. I came to Oakwood College. We had no money. My daughters came and didn't have to worry about tuition, room, board, fees, pocket money, but I had to. I only had $300 total because my mother emptied her bank account. $300 at the time, it cost $900. And I want you to remember these names also, because not only did Pastor Willis make sure that I had a job every summer so that I could make money to return to Oakwood University, but there are two other people. One is at rest now. The other is watching from his home. Dr. Oliver Davis and Dr. Ruth Faye Davis. May God rest her soul. They made sure that I always had a job. 
And in fact, I worked my way through Oakwood with three jobs. They did not have the financial means, but they made sure that I had a job so I could afford Oakwood University. And I worked three jobs every semester until I graduated. I am standing in the gap. When I wrote the book, Raise a Leader, it was the, with the idea of funding scholarships for our students. That fund is about to hit $200,000. It will be an endowment to support students. In addition to that, my husband and I have committed, and every year, we give close to $40,000. Money that we could spend on ourselves. And that's in addition to what our daughters and their families give to Oakwood University. My daughter, Karen Elise Pollard Smith, and her husband, Damod Smith, and their children, they are givers to Oakwood University and to our students. Our older daughter, Christine Pollard Keel, and her husband, Demetrius Keel, givers, donors to Oakwood University, we are standing in the gap. Thank you. We too want to stand in the gap so that next year we will not be talking about approximately 200 students that cannot attend or had to leave Oakwood because of finances. And so we are going to stand in the gap. And if you remember on this slide, it's about an average of $10,000 a student needs who leaves because of financial reason. And we want to support one student. With $10,000. And we will commit to, to, to that. That's today. But also two and a half students every year for the next four years. God bless you. So, Elder Bryant, um, Prudence and I are not wealthy people, but we brought a check today as well. Um, and we would like to donate to Standing in the Gap. In addition to the monies that we've given, we'd like to present a check to Ms. Ava Willis Barksdale today for $10,000. As I said, our board have been talking about this and we voted this. Elder Watkins has been working with others who wanted to be the first fruits of those standing in the gap as we invite you to join us. Elder Watkins. Thank you, Mr. President. I know that the hour is getting later, but this is about the students, amen? All about the students. Standing in the gap, students who fall through the cracks. Well, I'm happy to present to you some individuals who are the first to stand in the gap. I'm going to ask Dr. Vandian Griffin and the director of Beta to come and to stand in the gap. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, too, am a proud graduate of this institution, and I have an amazing daughter, uh, Kaylin, who is directing the choir today, who is a student here, and uh, we think it is, it is of utmost importance that we stand in the gap. And so I'm standing here uh, with the first female president of the Black Adventist Youth Directors Association and the person of Dr. Paula Olivier. And today we want to stand in the gap 
and we have something to give. I'm going to ask her to speak at this time. We thank God for Oakwood University. I too am a graduate of Oakwood, Oakwood College, and many of our beta uh, directors are graduates of Oakwood. And we want to stand in the gap today by giving $10,000 to the students at Oakwood. Thank you, thank you, madam. And our young people stepping up to the plate, standing in the gap. So many of our young people come and we lose them because of finances. So the young people, the youth directors of the North American Division, they are standing in the gap. Now, I want to bring Dr. David Law. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I represent the class of 1979 and our class is standing in the gap today with a gift of $10,000, with more coming later on this afternoon when I get to talk to a few more of my classmates. So we're looking forward to even giving more by the grace of Almighty God. Thank you, the first class. Next year we will have other classes. This is our first year of standing in the gap for our young people. Now I want to bring on Dr. Abraham Jules, president of the great Northeastern conference. Amen, amen, Dr. Watkins, our conference is standing in the gap with a check today for $50,000. Dr. Jules, say that again. $50,000. And I want to personally thank you for that. When I called you, you did not hesitate. When I explained to you what the gap was all about, he said, Elder Watkins, I have so many students from Northeastern Conference. I will not shy away from this. You can count on the great Northeastern Conference. Give them a round of applause one more time. Thank you, Dr. Jules, for that. God bless you. Elder Pollard. We will see a tribute very shortly to Dr. Benjamin Reeves, our ninth president who passed away. But our 10th president, Dr. Delbert Baker and Mrs. Susan Baker. Any students here? He had a long tenure, graduated under Dr. Baker. Would you stand, please? Stand, all of the students. Wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> okay, okay. So we are going to bring up Dr. Baker, but before him is going to be the chairman, uh, excuse me, the chairman of our subcommittee, for advancement, Dr. Zavon Canyon, but Dr. and Mrs. Baker are here and we celebrate them. And Dr. Baker, we thank you for your service to Oakwood University. Oh, there you are. All of those years, the blessings that your, your ministry and your leadership represented, and we celebrate you. We stand on your shoulders. Dr. Zavon Canyon. As the president said, I'm here on behalf of the university's board of trustees and its subcommittee advancement and development. We're the fundraisers and are going to be heavily involved in standing in the gap. As the president also, well he didn't say, I am a proud member of the class of 1975. And we are standing in the gap and will celebrate 50 years next year and bring our report to you. Dr. Delbert Baker happens to be not only a former president of the university, but also is the president, or was the president, and is the president of our class. Come, Dr. Baker, and talk about the class, and be sure and remind them that uh, we're beyond the three score and 10. <laughs> Memories are a powerful thing. And as I have witnessed and heard the wonderful testimonies, my heart has been touched as I reflect back the years. And I have a triple burden this morning, and I feel like I'm under the inspiration of the Spirit. Uh, I was a student here, Dr. Pollard, uh, Dr. Bryant. I heard the stories. I was a literature evangelist, ran short of money, had to come here, and it was wonderful people who helped me do similar things that you have described. 
Not only that, but as a president, my wife and myself, Susan, if you come stand by me, we served here the 14 years, and we saw Dr. Pollard, like you and Dr. Pollard, saw so many students who struggled. And I heard about standing in the gap, uh, and I was moved by it in print, but hearing it this morning, and Dr. Bryant, you and your wife, I was just sharing with him, I've never heard a board cheer so eloquently and so clearly stand behind an initiative of the university like I have this Sabbath. And so we were inspired first as, a stu as students, Susan and myself, where we found each other. And then secondly, as presidents, uh, presidential couple. And now this morning, I'm representing the class of 1975, an illustrious class, an outstanding class. Now, please, I got to give it to 1974. You've done well. I got to give it to you, not take anything away from that. But you have inspired us. And if Dr. Rock is watching right now, we this 1975 was the class that was the first four-year class under him. So we feel a special responsibility. We want to go beyond. And Perret, I should, Mar I should say Marilyn Lang and Perret, uh, and other the class officers, Dr. Canyon and others, we have been working with the class for the last um, year or so, planning and saying, how can we make this coming year extraordinary? And so the class is with me when I speak. We want to do something special. We won't make any claims right now that we can't live up to, but we will do something special. And class of 74, we don't want to come behind you. We want to stand in the gap. I want to make one final word. I heard the wonderful things this morning, and I'm going to say something that I hope I don't regret. But you know, you know how it is when you're in the moment? <laughs> you get caught up in the moment. Well, uh, I'm in the moment. I'm here with all you wonderful people, and I'm thinking back over the years. When we left in 2010 as a result of running for scholarships, we established a scholarship program of $500,000. Well, since that time, in these 13 years, it has grown uh, to 780 plus thousand. As a result of the Standing in the Gap program, Dr. Pollard and Dr. Bryant, my wife and I are committing ourselves, and we'll do it, you know, so aside from what we do with the class. We, we want to say that between now and the end of this end of next time, I should say alumni weekend next year, that we want to make that $789,001 million. Now, now I said it, now, now Susan, I said it, you heard me, I asked her could I say it first, and she said yes, Delbert, but if you say it, you know you're obligated. So by the grace of God, uh, we'll see what we can do. We want to help you, Dr. Bryant. Uh, Dr. Pollard to stand in the gap along with our class. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for your commitment, and we will hold you to your pledge. But listen, let me tell you something. How many of you are just like Elder Bryan and just like me? I never would have made it. Never would have made it out of Oakwood if somebody had not come to my aid. My story, Elder Brian's story, is like your story. 47 years ago, I was about to leave this campus. Had scholarships, but I had that back bill. Young man approached me. He said, man, did you get registered? I said, no. He said, what happened? I said, I'm about $2,500 short. You know what he did? He said, come walk with me took me to the financial aid office. He had money on his account. He told them, take that money on my account, put it on Calvin Watkins' account. What if he hadn't done that? I don't know where I'd be. Never would have made it. Dr. Brian, I would not be your vice president. I'd be driving a bus somewhere. Nothing wrong with that. But look at what God has done because somebody stood in the gap for me. 
He didn't know it, but I invited him. This young man right here, Robert Smith, come up here. Give him a round of applause. I never forgot what you did for me as a student. You were poor and broke, wearing run over shoes, but you gave me $2,500. Why did you do that? You were a student and you stood in the gap. 1973, we started the LETC, the publishing industry. And over, I have made sure over 50 students graduated by going to sell books and magazines throughout North America. And now you're leaders, you're doctors and lawyers and Oakwood graduates. And I had money. Danny was a pastor, didn't have to worry about tuition. And so when Calvin told me his dilemma, I saw he had some potential. And I wanted to do what Jesus would do. I want to encourage our fellow colleagues, pastors, and leaders to stand in the gap and do what Jesus would do. Learn, as Henry Wright used to preach in Columbus, Ohio, to bear the infirmities of the weak. That's what I want to encourage my fellow colleagues to do. Thank you for this opportunity to serve. Thank you, Elder Smith. And remember, let's stand in the gap, and next year will be a powerful year. How many doctors, lawyers, and nurses have fallen through the cracks because somebody didn't stand in the gap? Elder Bryant. You know, this is not just about an education down here. The impact of Oakwood goes far beyond what happens and our educational experience down here. It has eternal impact. And so I thank those who have joined and we encourage all of those and, and whatever God has impressed you to, to give, give. Um, I have the privilege as a North American Division president to sit in many boards and I see a lot of things. I see a lot of money coming and going. And I've talked with my colleagues and we have voted to help in this Standing in the Gap to donate one million dollars to the Standing in the Gap proposal from the North American Division uh, for this year. And may it help many students, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Now folks, Elder Bryant didn't say that the way it should have been said, and you didn't respond the way you should have responded. He said one million Dollars. Will you stand to your feet and let's give our division a big round of applause for those students who fall through the cracks. Thank you so much, Elder Brian. Thank you so much to the North American Division. God bless you. Good afternoon. My name is Ava Willis Barksdale. This is my husband. Byron Barksdale. I don't have a long story to tell. I could tell a long story. However, I think you've heard enough long stories. <laughs> you see, these are my friends. All I want to say is this. You know, all of you are sitting there. You look real good. You're thinking about all the things that have been said. You've seen the data, but everybody is not impacted by data. Some people don't even believe data. They think statistics are manipulated. You've heard some stories. Most of us are old. We graduated from Oakwood College 100,000 years ago. But what I really want you to remember is all those students you saw earlier and the students that are sitting here, and the students that haven't even gotten here yet, because that's what we're really doing this for. Um, and if that is not enough, because some of us are just selfish, think about yourself. Think about who you were before you got to Oakwood. Think about what Oakwood helped you to become 
and think about the way your life has been transformed and able to do the things that you would like to do, like rent a nice car, come to alumni weekend, get that suit. And in that moment, try to close the proverbial gap that is between this pulpit and y'all, and be part of this whole effort. You might not have a million, but apparently we're halfway there. But what you have today in your pocket, that might be a nice token to give. But what I really want you to consider is when you're home after this, when you think about what you do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, that you know you can stretch. You can do what others have done in the past. You can do what others did for you. And you can be part of standing in this gap now and in the future. And so that Oakwood University is forever until the Lord comes. And so with that, I'm hoping there are people who are going to lift this offering. And you can certainly use the QR code if your phone goes that far. So we can do low tech, we can do high tech, but all of you can support. Thank you.
University Aeolians. As we think about 23, 24, and how much God has done, we also take this time to honor those who um, have been laid to rest this year since we met last year for Alumni Weekend. And one of the ones um, was the president when I came to Oakwood University in 1994, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. Dr. Benjamin Reeves was a stalwart of a man his presence was amazing. When he walked in the room, you knew he was there with that deep bass voice. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to work for his wife my first quarter. Um, and so, so blessed to be able to honor him. Uh, he passed earlier this year. Uh, it was even wonderful to see him later after he retired uh, from Oakwood um, as one of the voices on PBS. Yeah. Uh, he had a show on PBS, and so it was nice to tune in and see him on Sunday mornings. And so we are going to go to a video to honor him um, and those Oakwoodites um, who we were able to lay to rest um, this, this past year. You know, Audrey, um, I'm just thinking about that there are so many people that we love that have passed that have made sacrifices for us, um, sacrifice for this institution, um, and we know that they will be truly missed. Um, and during their time, they make such a bigger impact. I think about my own grandfather that passed not too long ago, um, who was also attended Oakwood, who made sacrifices for me to be here. And I just think of so many other individuals who are going to forever be in our memories and forever be in the heart of Oakwood. Indeed. So please join us now as we celebrate the remarkable lives of these individuals and as we remember them for their accomplishments and for everything that they've done, not just for Oakwood, but for the world at large. God has placed here the leader for the next century. Go on! Go on! For your challenge is crisp and clear and unmistakably compelling. Benjamin F. Reeves, 1985 to 1996 the ninth president of Oakwood University. Dr. Benjamin Reeves distinguished himself through his ongoing work and vision for this remarkable university. Dr. Reeves was known for his homiletical skill, for his cool and dashing and debonair persona, for his commitment to scholarship, for the acuity of his mind, for the precision of his articulation, his enunciation. He mastered the short form sermon, 20 minutes, and he would wake the dead. Today, we celebrate his legacy. We certainly extend our condolences to the family of Dr. Reeves, to both Pam and Terry. Pam and Terry, your family have suffered losses that are unimaginable. As you have suffered losses recently, your mother, your brother, and now your father know that our Oakwood University community stands with you. May you be blessed and edified knowing that his legacy will last and endure forever. Thank you for sharing him with our campus community. We miss him already. May he rest in peace. It was in 1994 that 
our president, Dr. Benjamin Reeves, invited me to serve as his vice president for administration and planning. Dr. Reeves was a man of few words, but every word that he uttered had impact. Let me tell you about a time when we were sitting together in his office. He had just returned from the general conference year-end meeting, and we were looking through and going over a number of initiatives that I had been working on. And Dr. Reeve said to me, he said, Prudence, here's what I appreciate. You're able to prioritize your responsibility. His sermons were impactful. Today, I mourn the loss of a dear friend. And I'm thankful that I was able to see Dr. Reeves recently. Pam and Terry, you were sitting there in the room when we came to visit with our president, the ninth president of Oakwood University, my professor, my leader, my president, Dr. Benjamin Reeves. Heaven will be sweet when I'm able to look into Dr. Reeves' eyes and say, Doc, I finished my course. I've done what I was called to do. And it's a blessing to sit here with you again. I first met Dr. Benjamin Reeves when he served as a faculty member and eventually chair of the religion department at Oakwood University. But I really got to know him a few years later when he became president and invited me to come to be vice president for advancement and development. Our goal was to work together to raise a lot of money for Oakwood University. Dr. Reeves conceived of a plan called the Shields of Gold. I could tell you a lot about that, but I just don't have time. But the joke that we had behind the scenes was, Dr. Reeves was a well-known preacher and theologian. So we wondered how could he be a professional fundraiser? The latter years of his presidency of Oakwood, he achieved a level of celebrity that was unknown to most presidents of most universities. By reading children's books, reading stories to children, every week he would drive up to up Mount Sano to the public radio, public television station, and in a big plush chair, he would read inspirational stories to children. The book is called Ridiculous. It was written by Michael Coleman, and the pictures were drawn by Gwyneth Williamson. Are you ready? Dr. Benjamin Franklin Reeves was a mentor of mine. He was my greatest mentor. And he was my teacher in the seminary. The first encounter that I had with him was our class in uh, homiletics in the seminary. I found him to be one who was always in, uh, interested in the students that he taught. He was significant in what he did in catapulting me into thinking that I can do the best by coming to him and by positioning myself with his teaching style. I believe that he was significant in providing me with a, uh, an understanding not of only of, of how to teach, how to, how to teach, but also how to move uh, a, a department along significantly. Continue faithfully to live the future which God promised you. Do not become entangled with compromise or misdirected by secondary commitments. Turn off and claim the high ground. Oakwood, our danger is to forget our destiny. Our duty is Turn north, go up, and to the young people that we serve, by the grace of Almighty God, there is no time to allow the allurement of secondary values or the attraction of alternative purposes or aimless living to entangle you in competing commitments. You have no time for the misdirection of the trajectory of your life. We are called by God 
to claim the high ground. Strong now, my child. This will last but a while. Though the ones departed were part of you. Yes, it hurts to let go, but I won't. When you're broken hearted, I feel it too. And in your distress, when you possess no more strength to climb, I'll sustain. Just.
world that we live in, the comforting feeling, knowing that God is coming back to save us, that's what keeps us going. So if you are discouraged, if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling you want to throw in the towel, just hold on. God is with you. He has never left you. He will never forsake you. Don't be discouraged. Cause joy comes in. Joy comes in the morning. You got to know that God is not. Stand still and look up. Cause God is going to show. God is going to show up. Oh, he is there. He is standing by. Because there's healing, there's healing for your sorrow. There is healing for your pain. Healing for your pain. There's healing, healing for your spirit. Because there's shelter from. Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, thank you for allowing us to celebrate together another Sabbath day. We are just reminded that many who were here last year are not with us today. And we realize that we didn't wake ourselves up every day over the last year. We did not get ourselves here safely. We did not even get ourselves to this place by ourselves. It is only of your mercies, the protection of the holy angels, Lord, and we are so thankful for this. And we are thankful for life. But we do pray for our institution, for Oakwood University. You've heard and we've heard all of the needs that we have this morning. Lord, we know there are students right now who don't know how they're going to march at graduation because their bills are not paid. But you've put it in our hands and in our pockets to help them, Lord. And we pray that every young person who studied at this institution, who's, who's, who's worked so hard for this upcoming graduation, Lord, that they will be in that number, that you will provide through us and through you the means that they need. We pray for the leadership of this church at every level 
at every level, Lord. We pray for them in a special way. We pray for the members of our churches, though those who this morning in our absence turned on the lights and taught Sabbath school and taught our little children, Lord. We thank you for the members of our churches who serve faithfully week in, week out. Lord, it does not escape us that our nation is in turmoil, political turmoil, Lord. This, this nation that came out of prophecy, and it seems as though in many ways they've turned their backs on some of those who are less privileged and are of different skin hues. But Lord, we lift this nation up to you today. We, we know that we're getting down to the end of time. But we ask a special blessing on our leaders in this nation. And Lord, all around the world, there are wars and rumors of wars. Lord, we pray for peace on this earth, but we know that you've told us when we cry, peace and safety, behold, sudden destruction comes. Lord, so be merciful to us. And lastly, Lord, we remember that this is a holy convocation here. We're, we're here about our school. We're here about finances. We're here about fellowship and with laughter and, and good times and good memories. But this is a holy convocation. And we lift up Pastor Snell to you today. Bless him in a marked and marvelous way, as you always do, Lord. And may this gathering of your children in this place today bring honor and glory to you. We ask in the worthy and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. very much for the prayer, Elder Winston. I, a mistake of the mind, not the heart, there was one group that we want to recognize today who care for our campus. When you and I go to bed, often they're up at night, and that is the entire physical facilities team. Can you put your hands together for them? Would you be willing to stand and express your appreciation for what they do for our institution? Sometimes it's, it's easy to honor those who, um, because of educational attainment, are able to make contributions that are very visible. But we thought that as a team, we want to say thank you to our physical facilities team for all the work that they do to keep our campus functional and operational. And we appreciate them so very, very much. So let me just say that the leader of this great team, and let me give you just a quick example. Can I give you just a quick example of how, how this team works? Last Sabbath morning, we had a boiler blowout in Wade Hall. Anybody heard about that? Did anybody hear about that? Ha anybody happen to hear about that? <clears throat> now, I've said before, Elder Brian, don't get, I don't want to get in trouble with my chairman. We're not going to chase rabbits. We're going to issue a statement. This is what happened. This is what we're doing. That's the way we're going to work. We're not going to... We're going to get out of the comment section. So what we did was we had the team. They worked all day Sabbath trying to identify a source. They did. On Monday, they contracted for temporary mobile units, shower units. On Tuesday, by Tuesday, they had secured a boiler. By Wednesday, the old boiler was being removed. 
by today. Irvin, do you want to give us the latest update? Come, come, Irv. Come, Irv. Irv is from Miami, can't you tell? Come, Irv. Come, Irv. Come, Irv. Uh, yeah, by this afternoon, uh, at sunset, we'll crank up the boiler. Um, the vendors, the boiler vendors worked all evening until Sabbath yesterday. But it's functioning. It has been restored, so the young ladies of Wade will have hot water tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Brother Urban Raphael shortened a six-week process to one week. Come on, say amen, somebody. And we stand to encourage and to support you, Irv. So let's come forward, please, Irvin. Irvin is the perfect director for physical plant, except that he loves the Miami heat, and that's a problem, and that's a problem. Uh, so Oakwood University Employee Appreciation, Irvin Raphael, Director of Physical Plant, in recognition of exceptional dedication and excellence for your outstanding contribution, commitment, hardworking, passion. Thank you for making a difference. Presented on this 30th day of March, 2024, Leslie Pollard, President. Yes, please. We have two more, and we'll be, we'll be out of the way, and we'll be ready for the word, Elder Snell. We also have custodial and supervisory facilities. Miss Sarah Faria, come on, put our hands together, everybody, in recognition of your exceptional dedication and excellence and your outstanding contribution. Thank you, Sarah, for making a difference. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. And this is the team, everybody, electricians, plumbers, you name it. They do the work, and Dr. Baker, you know, without these people, that campus comes to a grinding halt. So thank you so very much. Let's give them a big hand again, everybody. God bless you. And Carlos Coles, we celebrate him as well. He'll give his another day. Happy Sabbath, church. I am delighted to introduce our speaker for the hour. A native of Tallahassee, Florida, Pastor Deblier Snell graduated with a BA in theology from Oakwood College in 1999. That spring, he accepted a call to pastor with the South Central Conference. Following Oakwood, Pastor Snell began his graduate study matriculation at Andrews University. While at Andrews, he served as the youth pastor for the Praise Fellowship SDA Church in South Bend, Indiana. In 2001, he received his Master of Divinity from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Just before graduation, he began courting the formal Gianna Norman. Pastor Snell's life was made complete as they married in 2003. Pastor and Mrs. Snell have three children, Jaden, Brooke, and Brayden. Snell has pastored in Columbus, in West Point, Mississippi, Lexington, Kentucky, and Huntsville, Alabama. Pastor Snell also serves as an adjunct professor for the religion department at Oakwood University. He has written seven books and has had numerous articles and essays published. Pastor Snell currently serves as the senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church and the speaker slash director of the Breath of Life Ministry. Snell's favorite text is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are, have become made new. As we are before, after we are ministered to by the Aeolians, the next voice you will hear is Pastor Deblier Snell. Happy Sabbath once again. I just want to let you all know that we are so excited and happy to be here celebrating this alumni weekend. We have our concert and the Vesper service at the OUC Church. I know it was mentioned once before, but for those who may have come afterwards, we look forward to seeing you all there at 6 o'clock at the OUC Church. Thank you.
Let's put, let's put our hands together for the aliens one more time today. <clears throat> amen, amen. If God has been good, won't you say amen one more time? If he's been real good, you ought to shout hallelujah. If you love him, say thank you, Jesus. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Giving him the glory and honor that he deserves today. I don't know about you, friends, but I'm glad to be here at Alumni Weekend. What do you say? Spirit of the Lord has been heavy with us both on last night's service and in today's service. And we thank God for his appearing. Let me just first begin today by expressing my gratitude for the stellar leadership of our president, Dr. Leslie Pollard. Can you say amen? Dr. Pollard, we listened to you as you talked about the challenges facing higher education. And we want you to know that you don't face those challenges alone, but you have our collective prayers and support. And we are grateful that God has given you the strength to bear that burden with a grace that makes the burden seem like it is effortless for you to carry. And so we thank God for the way that he uses you to lead our institution for such a time as this. And then I want to thank Dr. Parker for the great organization of this weekend. One of the things the Bible says is that one of the gifts of the Spirit is administration. And so you know the anointing is upon occasion, on occasion, not just by what happens up front, but by how smoothly things operate behind closed doors. And so we're grateful for the operations of the Spirit in the organization of Alumni Weekend. Now, before we get to the word, I do want to announce that I am a proud member of the class of 1999. <laughs> I thank God that he allowed me to be a cohort with some amazing people who are still walking in the hands of the Lord 25 years later. And even though, friends, I am grateful to celebrate 25 years, it's a little sober to see how fast 25 years goes by. Am I telling the truth? In fact, there's a time where they're calling you the young people. <laughs> then you look up one day and they're talking about somebody else when they refer to young people. And, and it's interesting, I got an interesting letter a couple weeks ago, I turned 47 years old, and I got a letter from the AARP section. And church, it was cold-blooded because the letter said, you're not eligible yet, but we'll be seeing you soon. <laughs> and so I am thankful that God has given us 25 years post-graduation. I do want to just take a moment briefly to acknowledge the presence of my wife. I want to invite my wife Gianna to stand. Can you give her a hearty amen today? We've been married now for 20 years, four months, 18 days, about 20 hours, and 12 minutes. And every day with her gets a little sweeter than the day before. And I'm grateful to have our three kids, my youngest son, Braden, my daughter, Brooke. And I want to invite my oldest son, Jaden, to stand. He'll be embarrassed. But he just turned 14 years old today. Can you join me in wishing him a happy birthday? Amen. And so there's never a dull moment in our house. In fact, he asked me earlier today, Daddy, what will we get to do now that I'm 14? I said, son, now that you're 14... I'm going to let you use the keys to my riding lawnmower. Are y'all hearing me today? <laughs> and so there are privileges <laughs> and liberties that come with getting a little older. Amen? And I just before we get into the word, I want to thank you for your support of the Breath of Life ministry. For these last two years, because of your support, we've been able to put our broadcast in five new cities including our first international broadcast in the UK and the continent of Africa. Because of your support, we now have children's content for our little ones and weekly program designed to help you grow in your spiritual walk with God. 
And so I want to encourage you on tomorrow at 12 to stop by the Office of Regional Conference Ministry where we'll have an open house where we can share our words of appreciation for your support over the last couple of years. And so, friends, we want to go ahead and get into the word. Is that all right? I want to just draw your attention to the fact that it's 2.05 p.m. already. Now, I don't say that to throw shade, but I just need a sermonic alibi. So that when they say y'all got out of the church after 2 o'clock, it wasn't my fault. Can I get a witness today? But I want to invite you to stand to your feet today as we go two places quickly in the Word. If you don't mind, begin with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and then put your finger over in Acts chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we're going to begin together at verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. And if you don't mind, put your finger over in Acts chapter 2. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm there. The Bible says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the what? First fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Now go quickly to Acts chapter 2 and we'll look together at verse number 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when you get there, say, Pastor, I'm there. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And notice it says that one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began speaking with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Today, saints, for just a little while with God's help, I want to talk to you under the subject, false pretenses. False pretenses. Let us pray. Father, would you draw so close that the heat of your spirit knocks the chill off of this service? My prayer today is not just for oration, but I pray that there would be a revealing of your spirit in our time that is historic. So, Lord, would you please hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone might be heard, and at the end of our time together, let Jesus alone be praised. Bless us to this end, we ask. In the wonderful name of Jesus, let those who believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. You know, friends, a few years back, I planned a surprise birthday party for my wife at our home. And so the gifts had been purchased, the guests had been invited, the theme of the party had been established. But because my wife can sometimes be punctually impaired, 
I had to create a false pretense to get her home before our guests became weary. And pardon me for faking a church emergency so that she would get home by the appropriate time. I had to create a reason and an urgency to get her in the right location for the occasion. And she thought, church, that she was hurrying home in order to relieve me of the kids, but it was simply a false pretense so that she might receive the gifts that had been prepared for her. And can I suggest, friends, that Christ the bridegroom has blessings for us that we know not of. And at times, God allows circumstances to push us into a particular location for a moment of destiny that we might receive what he has in store. And so at times, God allows or creates a false pretense to get us in a certain place at a certain time that you might receive what God has in store for you, his child. In other words, church, Joseph was sent to Egypt under false pretenses. Joseph thought he was there to serve as a slave, but after things played out, Joseph said to his brothers, you sent me, sold me, but God sent me. You, God took what you meant for evil and reshaped it so it worked out for my good. You realize that David went to the battle under false pretenses. His dad sent him there with food and supplies for his brethren, but it was God God creating a moment for him to defeat Goliath so that his ultimate purpose might be revealed. Paul went to Damascus under false pretenses. He went there thinking his job was to destroy the church, but God re-intercepted uh, re things so that he could be used to build the church. You see, in Proverbs, it says, in a man's heart, he plans his course, but it is the Lord that determines his steps. And God is like a deistic algorithm who is able to take your choices, your enemy's schemes, and even your mistakes and manage them with such prophetic accuracy that he gets you where he pre-willed and predestined you to be. And it is why Romans 8 is true, that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his promise. In other words, church, this is not just my theology. It is actually my lived truth. In fact, I remember here in 1998 as a junior theology major just praying that one day I would get a call into the ministry. I remember like it was yesterday. It was All-Star Weekend, and Dr. and Mrs. Pollard were having their farewell at the Oakwood University Church. And so they needed some students to give remarks at the service. And so the USM president at the time could not make it. And so he asked the religious vice to come. And because the religious vice had an appointment, the burden fell upon me. And I tried to give it to somebody else, but nobody else would take it. And so, friends, I remember going down to the church with a bad attitude and a poor disposition. But somehow the Spirit blessed my evil spirit and the words that I put together, so much so that the president of South Central at the time, Joseph McCoy, stood up and said, who is that young man? I want you to make him stay by at the end of service because I want to talk to him about joining South Central Conference. In other words, friends, I thought I was sent as a backup, but God created a pretense for a setup for me to become who he He's ordained me to be. In other words, if I never join SCC, I never wind up at OUC, and I never start leading BOL, and so I just praise G-O-D that he ordered my steps according to his word. Are you hearing me today? Ah, and so friends today, I want to spend just a few moments talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, to some, that subject may not necessarily fit this particular occasion. 
But the more I thought about it, friends, I realized that the subject of the Holy Ghost is congruent in content with this particular weekend. Now, friends, I find it interesting that it is there at the day of Pentecost that God poured out the Holy Spirit according to the promise of Jesus. And it is interesting because most of us associate the term Pentecost with the phrase Holy Spirit. But how many of us know that in origin the term Pentecost has nothing to do with the Holy Ghost? In fact, the day of Pentecost Pentecost was simply one of the Jewish festivals that was on their annual calendar. In fact, the day of Pentecost was simply a celebration of the completion of the harvest of the annual Jewish grain crop. In other words, after the day of Passover, they would present the first fruit of the grain harvest, and then 50 days later, Pentecost would occur, which symbolized the end of the harvest season. In other words, friends, those that came for Pentecost were not there to have an encounter with the Holy Ghost. Those that came for Pentecost didn't come to learn anything about Jesus. They just showed up because it was on the annual calendar. In other words, before the Holy Spirit Pentecost was just their Jewish alumni weekend. Uh, uh, before the Holy Ghost, Pentecost was simply where alums from Jerusalem came on an annual basis to get reacquainted with those they hadn't seen for a while. Pentecost was simply where alums bought clothes they could not afford and rented the most expensive camels to impress people that were not thinking about them when they came. Uh, you see, Pentecost was a place of distorted recollections where former athletes were able to exaggerate their legend because there weren't enough people still alive to contradict their account. It was a time where veracity became elastic as we began to talk about our previous uh, uh, things and our current successes. And friends, what I simply want to prosper is that the same way this festival had nothing to do with the Holy Ghost, I believe that God simply used the festival as a pretense in order to get everybody in the same place. Maybe that occasion was just how God got everybody in the same room. Maybe it was just how God got everybody to cheer for the same thing. Maybe it was just how God got everybody to come from different parts of the world. It was simply a ruse by which God poured out his spirit upon the church. And friends, I could not help but wonder if God wanted to use this gathering at alumni to do something greater for the church than what we came to experience. Maybe some of us came this year in order to celebrate a particular honor class. Maybe somebody came simply because it's been a minute since you came. Maybe somebody came to see who is still single or newly divorced. Maybe somebody came simply because you were to support an honoree or because you are being honored. But can I suggest that maybe God wanted to draw all of his people from all over the world for a particular purpose, and his goal in this arena was not just to raise money for scholarships. His goal was not for you to just celebrate the four or nine behind your years. 
here. Maybe his goal was not just for you to be seen in your fancy attire. Maybe God brought you all the way here so that he could pour out the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, church, could it be that right now heaven's raptors are sagging with frustrated power because God wants to send a power that we're not ready to receive? And one of the things I want to say is that I believe every gathering of this sort ought to be considered a candidate for the outpouring of the latter rain. And see, friends of mine, my fear for some of us today is that we will have come from across one coast to the next. Some will have been driven from the east coast all the way from the south, and we'll come to alumni and leave worse spiritually than how we came. You see, the problem with some is that we're going to sit through a thousand concerts. We're going to listen to a half dozen sermons. We're going to gather every souvenir and every replica. And we're going to go back home with every gift except the gift of the Holy Spirit. And see, friends of mine, I simply believe today that God wants to use this moment to create a spiritual redirection, to change the trajectory of where the church is moving in our time, if that makes sense. Let me hear you say amen. And so, friends, I believe that this can be an occasion. Do I have any witnesses here with me today? Is there anybody that's looking for the latter rain in your time? Is there anybody that believes the Holy Ghost is not a fictional character? Way to church at this afternoon. I, I believe that God wants to pour out the Holy Ghost, but there have got to be three focuses in order for us to receive him. The first focus, friends, is that we've got to be more focused on the indwelling than our outfits. Okay, let, let, let me say it again. That if you're going to receive the Holy Ghost, you got to be more focused on the indwelling than the outfit you're wearing. And see, the problem with services like alumni is that at times we can be more focused on image than character. Acts of the Apostles, page 35, she says, as the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance. They confessed their sins and their unbelief. And they prayed not for a physical fitness, but they prayed for an earnest spiritual fitness to be fit to do God's will. And one of the things I simply want to suggest, friends, is that if we spent as much time seeking the Holy Ghost, as we did seeking our outfit or combination for today, the latter rain would have fallen a long time ago. And, and, and I know you're going to be in your feelings, but I'm going to stand here in the strength of God anyhow. Because, see, I need us to get friends that there is nothing wrong with having stylistic expression. There is nothing wrong with having outward appearance. But there is a problem if we build the outward at the expense of the inside. You see, friends of mine, I need us to know that our greatest need today is not external. Am I preaching to anybody today? In fact, friends, this is what brings judgment against the church of Laodicea, which represents the body in our time. For God says, your problem is that you say you're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, but you don't realize that internally you're poor and blind and miserable and naked. And watch this, church. The problem with Laodicea is not that they have external opportunities because that blessing give, it was given to them by God. But the problem with Laodicea is they are content with the appearance of wellness. In other words, they're straight just having people think that they're doing well. And the problem is that when you focus on the outside, it's going to create a spiritual plateau because what Laodicea did is they allowed their external surplus to be a ruse to cover their internal deficits. And see, friends, I want to just suggest today that there is a problem in the church 
if you spent more time preparing your hair than you did preparing your heart for worship this afternoon. Uh, it's a problem, church, if you spent more time searching for your suit than searching your soul before God. It's a problem if your shirt went to the cleaners but your spirit did not. It is a problem if you bent your knees to polish your rims, but you hadn't been on your knees to call on the name of God. There is something wrong if you lifted your hand to take a selfie, but you couldn't lift your hands to praise the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the reason the service is so cold is because you're sitting here too cute. Like God hadn't done nothing for you. If you just opened up your mouth, we would have a little more heat in this place. Maybe if you lifted a hand, maybe if you tapped a foot, maybe if you ran a lap. Is anybody thankful today that God made a way when there was no way and that God came through right on time? And some graduated summa cum laude, and some graduated magna cum laude. But do I have any in the balcony that graduated? Thank you, Lord. And what I'm saying to somebody today, friends, is that there's got to be a little less focus on the outside and the building of the inside. And see, the issue, friends, is how God makes people. See, when God builds a man, he doesn't build a man from his exterior in. God builds us from the inside out. And see, and that's why when you're growing spiritually, your growth ought to be like fruit. Have you ever noticed, friends of mine, that fruit grows from the inside out? So that when a piece of fruit is not ripe, what it does is it alerts its exterior disposition. So that when the orange or the banana or the apple is not ripe, when you touch it, it's going to be hard to the touch. And guess what? It's going to be green so that it's announcing on the outside that I'm not quite complete on the inside. But the great thing about fruit is that once it's ripe on the inside, what happens is it sends protein to break down the cellular wall so it's no longer hard, but it gets soft. And then when it gets ripe, it breaks down the chlorophyll, which is green, so that the green is removed and it begins to take its color so that once it's done on the inside, it's going to announce it to the outside so that when you bite it, you'll never be disappointed because the outside told you what was inside. And see, that's why you ought to have spiritual fruit instead of the potato chips of the flesh. Uh, uh, in other words, friends, fruit is developed from the inside. But have you ever noticed when you go to a bag of potato chips, man, that bag is puffy and it's full, but when you open it, it's only a third of chips at the bottom, and the rest is hot air. And the problem is that some of us got a lazy anointing because we all puffed up. But when you get close, ain't nothing but hot air. And I don't know about you, church. I'm just at a place where I want the Lord to do it inside first. Lord, do it in my heart. Lord, do it in my mind. Lord, do it in my spirit. I'm not worried about my outfit. I'm not worried about what they might say. I'm not worried about how they perceive me. I want character more than I want reputation. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Second thing this story teaches us as we focus is that we've got to focus not just on private worship, we've got to focus on the power of our public gathering. Now, y'all get a little quiet in here. I found this interesting, church. Did you notice in verse 6 that those that came from out of town, the Bible says that they were able to hear the sound. 
of the Spirit falling. In other words, church, they were close enough to hear the sound of the wind. They were close enough to hear the sound of them speaking in tongues. They were close enough to hear the sound of the Spirit, but they weren't close enough to experience the Holy Spirit. In other words, the problem was that when the Spirit was falling, some of them were in the lobby like those outside. They were close enough to hear it falling. But because they were not in the upper room, they served the sound of the evidence, but they didn't have the experience because when they came for alumni, they spent more time in the lobby and more time in the outer court than they spent in the upper room. I know y'all going to cancel me today, but I'm here for it. I'm here for it. And, and Dr. Pollard, I, I don't know what we got to do to change the culture of this service, but we've got 40-year lack of institutional control where we can and have more people in the outside than we have where prayers are being made and the gospel is being preached. Are y'all hearing me today, Sans? And it's crazy because the Bible says that they hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now, it's crazy. I, I, the Brown, I used to always see this as a place of chaos and confusion where, man, God just fills up the room with mighty rushing wind. Hair is in somebody's faces. Wigs are being thrown out. Papers are being displaced. But understand that God is a God of order, so there is no confusion in this space. They don't feel wind. They just hear it. And it is to fulfill what Jesus said in John 3 when he says the spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. You just see the demonstration and the effects. And the reason God shows up with tongues of fire is simply to pro uh, complete the prophecy of what he said about John the Baptist where he says, John, baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. And I love what one scholar says because they didn't know how to expect or what to expect when the Holy Spirit came, God gave the Spirit display so that they would not miss the appearing of the Holy Ghost. And friends, I need you to notice something, that when the Holy Spirit fell, it did not settle upon them like a fog. Okay. When the Spirit fell, it did not settle on them like a cloud. But notice the word says that when the Spirit falls, it shows up in a fiery ball, but then it disperses itself so that each one has a cloven tongue sitting upon them individually. Oh, y'all missed it. You missed it. In other words, the Spirit does not settle upon them like a cloud where I can receive the Spirit by proximity or being in the room. No, when the Spirit showed up, He comes in a discerning fashion. So He doesn't just waste Himself and just pour Himself everywhere. He is targeted and He allows the Spirit to rest upon them individually as an outward sign of their determination to know God. Are y'all hearing me today? Now, the reason this is critical is because they meet the Spirit in a church gathering, but the Spirit falls on them individually. In other words, you couldn't get the Spirit by just happening to be at the right place at the right time. You had to be seeking Him privately in order to receive him publicly. Oh, y'all not hearing me today. And see, I love some of y'all that have great public demonstrations of worship, but you ain't got no private devotion with God. See, I need you to know that a public demonstration without a private connection ain't nothing but a pretend performance. 
And it's crazy because God is allowing some tensions that we kind of oftentimes see as being in conflict. These tensions don't collide, but they actually complement one another. Why? Because the Spirit falls in a corporate gathering. But guess what? They've got to know him individually in order to receive him. Why am I saying this? Because we are the generation in a post-pandemic world that has tried to displace the importance of the church gathering under the false pretense that we know God individually. But how many of us understand, friends, that those things were never supposed to be either or? It was supposed to be both and. It was never supposed to be either I pray at home or I pray at church. It was supposed to be both. It was never supposed to be I worship at home or worship at church. It was supposed to be both. It was never supposed to be I study at home or go to Sabbath school. It was supposed to be both. It was never supposed to be I I know God at home so I don't have to know him at church. No, understand there is nothing that we do in private that negates our need to come together as a group. And there is nothing that you get in church that negates your need to have personal uh, devotion and worship with God. In other words, it was never supposed to be one or the other. I was supposed to use one to augment the next, that my public was supposed to be an outgrowth of the private. In other words, church, I need you to know I study at home, I pray at home, I worship at home, but I'm just old enough that I can say like David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The promise is that when two or three gather in his name, in person or online, he'll be there in the midst. Is there anybody grateful that Psalms 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. The Bible says, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him with the timbrel and harp. Praise him on the high-sounding cymbals. Praise him on the loud cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the name of the Lord. Third thing, I'm moving quick today. Third focus is this, is that the spirit only falls in a place where there is unity. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not fall in a room where you got people in opposition on two different sides. The Spirit falls in a space where there is a oneness and a singleness of mission and purpose. Why y'all looking at me crazy today? Acts of the Apostles, page 36, Ellen White says that when they gathered in the upper room, watch this, they began putting away all differences, all desire for supremacy, and they came close together in Christian fellowship. Now watch this. Notice Ellen White says that they put away all differences. It didn't say they stopped having differences. In other words, when the Spirit comes, Lewis, he does not brainwash them into this spiritual nirvana where, man, they become people without choice of their own, where they see everything the same way, say everything the same way, and share their same worldview. In other words, they still have differences, but they do the hard, pride-swallowing work of setting aside their differences. And can I just say this quickly, church? My fear for Adventism, it is not outward persecution. See, we spend our whole time bracing for persecution. But why is the devil going to persecute churches that ain't growing? We ain't growing fast enough. For the devil to submit that type of force. Our greatest threat in our day and time, it is not, at least in North America, outward persecution, but it is an internal implosion that is the result of our factions and divisions in the church. And it 
it makes sense now why Jesus gave the instructions that he did before he ascended back to glory. Notice that we, we, we say the Lord's Prayer is uh, our Father which art in heaven. That's not the Lord's Prayer. E.D. Cleveland said that's the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer was one of unity where he said, Lord, make them one as you and I are one. Did you notice his instruction to the disciples that a house divided against itself cannot stand and he actually uses the devil as our example he says Belzebub will never be divided against itself because the devil knew that the demonic host would operate with more unity than the body of Christ and see the problem with the church is that we focus more on our differences than our commonalities. You see, friends of mine, I need you to know that I'm not going to allow our differences to put me on the opposite side of you. If you believe Jesus died, if you believe he rose, if you believe he's coming again, if you still believe in the message of the third angel, if you believe that the just shall be saved by faith, if you hold those beliefs in common, we are brethren. Because, church, I need y'all to remember, the disciples, they had differences of all sorts. Man, they had differences about who Jesus was. They had differences about their perception of the crucifixion. They had differences about what it meant to be a part of his kingdom. They had differences about who was going to play what role in the kingdom. But the thing I like about the disciples is that at some point they laid aside the differences. And it's crazy because we allow... All these stupid, can I just preach it like I feel it? I know you ain't supposed to say stupid on a college campus. But we allow all these little stupid factions to emerge in the church and keep us on opposite sides. And I ain't going to lie, y'all Adventists, y'all some funny people. Sometimes I have to dissociate myself from some of it. Because we're the only people that are vegetarian in theology, but cannibal in practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that, that's us. The only flesh some of y'all have ever eaten is human. You ain't never ate no chicken, no rack of lamb, but you chew on your pastors and your leaders and your choir directors. Ah, you just ripped the bone off. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. That's y'all. <laughs> oh, Lord. And guess what? We get into all these little different groups in church. And all these, again, stupid conversations on Facebook. And we, and we divide into sides based on those who love the hymns of the church versus those that love contemporary gospel. We create sides based on what we eat. So the vegetarians look down on the meat eaters. And then the vegans come along and look down their nose on all of y'all. Come on, y'all know I'm telling the truth. I mean, we literally allow ourselves to get divided over those who are jewelry free. <laughs> Don't cover your ears now. <laughs> and those who are jewelry full. Uh, we allow ourselves to get divided between those who believe women should be pastors and those who will literally leave a church because your pastor is a woman. 
And we allow these things to separate us with, with into variable or different camps within the body of Christ. And I need you to know that none of those things are actually essential to Adventist identity. All those things are peripheral. All those things are ancillary. None of those things speak to the content of who we are. Are y'all hearing me today, church? And it's a strange thing because the thing about the disciples is not that they don't have differences, but you know what they do in the upper room? At some point, the disciples simply call a truce. They, they make a decision that the promise that is coming is more important than the differences that are present. So we're going to call a truce so that we can receive the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And what I'm saying to the church in our time is that we need to call some truces. Can I suggest, friends, that we need to call a, 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 a worship truce? and stop being hymns versus gospel. And just remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says, sing unto the Lord with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and make a melody from your heart. We need to call a dietary truce and stop looking at one another's place because Jesus says it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles, but it's what comes out of your mouth that's going to put you in hell. We need to call a generational truce where the old are not fighting against the young. For Proverbs 16 says that a head of gray hair is a splendor and it is attained by a life of righteousness. But in 1 John chapter 2, God says, I call the young because they are strong. In other words, the old folk need the strength of the youth and the youth need the wisdom of the old. And we would be stronger together than we would be if we kept fighting fighting one another. There needs to be a truce between the laity and the clergy. I just went to the Holy Land. I ain't never seen no shepherd fighting against the sheep, but the shepherds give their lives for the sheep, and good sheep follow the good shepherd. And at some point, there's got to be a truce in the Oakwood community. At some point, there will have to be a truce between the administration and the alum. At some point, we're going to have to put aside our differences. At some point, we're going to have to get our business off the news, out the newspaper, out the comment section, and we've got to learn how to get into an upper room where prayer is being made and we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There needs to be a truce, a ceasefire where we get on the same page and we realize we are stronger together. Friends, have you ever noticed in the corporate room world, every now and then you'll have two titans of industry that will form a corporate merger. And you know there's a purpose behind it. It's not because one is out dueling the next, but at some point somebody in those two competing entities like Sprint and T-Mobile, they're like, man, why are we wasting our resources trying to fight one another and outdo one another for customers? You know what they say we're going to do? We're going to get together and form one super company, and we're going to develop a monopoly, and we're going to form our resources as one because we're stronger as a unit than we are as individuals. Okay, y'all didn't get that. Take your cue and watch just what happens in a minute in the Republican Party. Now, y'all just saw all the candidates for president, like they all got on the stage and talked about how crazy and unfit Donald Trump is. Y'all saw that, right? Now, watch in about a month and a half, all those who were saying he ain't the one, 
because they love the party. Because they value the party, are going to lay aside everything they just said so that the party they love is able to thrive. And what I'm saying is, friends, that if demons, I meant Republicans, I meant tomato, tomato, uh, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we shall push no political party. Uh, I don't want us to lose our 501c3. Come on and say that. But if in the world they can lay aside differences, what's wrong with the church of the living God? Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Listen, I'm done. Because some of y'all probably still sitting here wondering, well, why is the pastor talking about Pentecost on the weekend of the resurrection? Man, ask me, why am I talking about Pentecost on the weekend of the resurrection? I'm so glad you finally asked me because I've been waiting to tell you. Because the festival of Pentecost didn't so much point to the Holy Spirit. The festival of Pentecost was actually a foreshadowing of the resurrection. Oh, God. So remember, friends, that after the Passover, the first day of the next week, what they would do is they would present the first fruits as an offering to God. And once the priests Urim and Thummim began to light up as a sign that the first fruit offering was accepted, they would begin to praise him in advance. Because if the first fruit was accepted, it meant the rest of the harvest was on the way. Y'all missed it. In other words, Jesus died on Good Friday. He laid in the tomb on Sabbath. But early on the first day of the week, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus is the first fruit that was raised from the dead. And that's why he told Mary, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to my father. In other words, the first fruit offering had not yet been presented. But because God accepted the offering of the first fruit in Jesus that was raised from the dead, because Jesus broke the ground, because Jesus was raised, the rest of the harvest is guaranteed because the first fruit had been accepted. Y'all missed it. You realize that the primary theme for the our resurrection in the New Testament is the term harvest, which is why most cemeteries are called gardens. Oh, God. Because how many of us know you don't bury Christians you plant them. Oh, God. <laughs> you bury unbelievers, but you plant believers. So grandma ain't buried, she's planted. Your husband ain't buried, he's planted. Your mama ain't buried, she's planted. Your daddy ain't buried, he's planted. Because when I bury something, I ain't going to see it no more. But when I plant something, one day there's going to come a ladder rain and whatever was buried is going to break the ground. And those that have been planted in Christ, guess what? They're going to be raised in Christ and they're going to be raised with resurrection power, resurrection glory. Can anybody praise him that one day when we're raised, there'll be no more cancer and there'll be no more blindness and there'll be no more lupus and there'll be no more ERs for the former things will be passed away when Jesus comes. Are y'all hearing me today? Go ahead and play something. I'm done. 
And it's crazy because I'm still trying to figure out, Dr. Pollard, what's the correlation between Pentecost, the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit? So watch this. I love what Ellen White says here. She says here in Desire of Acts of the Apostles, page 38, that the Pentecostal outpouring. Y'all still with me, church? I'm done. I'm going to let y'all go home. The Pentecostal outpouring. Y'all still with me? I just need to make sure y'all don't miss this. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to the promise, he sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had as priest and king received all authority in heaven and on earth and that he was the anointed one. See, Daniel lets us know that the anointed one would get cut off in the middle of that 70th week. Oh, where the seven day Adventists at in this room? So I need you to understand the, the, the correlation between resurrection, Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all still here, church? So that as Jesus now ascends back to heaven, as the disciples stand there gazing, and a cloud is taking him away from their sight, and as Jesus approaches the portals of glory, now clothed in human garb, there are these great angels that guard the gates of pearl, and when they see the master coming, they say, lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, for the King of glory shall come in. And those on the inside say, who is this King of glory? And it's not that they don't know who he is. They just like hearing the sound of his name. And those who hold the gates say, he is the Lord strong and mighty. He is the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And it's crazy because Jesus Christ walks in in a form that is hardly recognizable by the angelic hosts that are used to seeing him in his pre-human form. And they begin to melt with a river of tears as they see scars in his hands, scars in his feet, and a wound still fresh in his side. And I can see my great Jesus still with the vestiges of a bloody cross as he begins to march or parallel with the river of the water from the stream of life toward the throne room of heaven. And I can see him marching toward his father's throne. And I can see him who is clothed in unapproachable light beginning to move toward the Son of God. And as he begins to approach the Son, the Son begins to declare to the Father, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood is sufficient for them. And see, what commences is what she described as a service of inauguration. Oh, God. You got to see this in heaven because remember that in, in ancient times when a king was seated and a king was established, they didn't just have him put his hands on a Bible and take an oath. You know what they did for a new king? They anointed him. And understand that old school anointings were not this neat thing where they just poured a dab on the finger and rubbed it on the head. But Dr. Watkins, they would take a big vessel full of oil and as Jesus knelt, they would begin to pour that big vessel of oil all over the king's head. And because anointing was messy, all the oil wouldn't rest on the head, but there would be some drops. There would be some drops that would fall from the head. And if you were serving the king, some of the anointing that fell from the king would fall on those who served the king. So what happened on the day of Pentecost? 
It was the day of Christ's anointing, where when the Spirit was poured on Christ, all of it didn't stay in heaven. There were a few drops that fell down to an upper room where the Spirit of God fell upon the disciples. And see, this is why Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do in my name because we're not fed from a different anointing. We walk in the same anointing that Jesus himself received. Are y'all hearing this today, friends? But friends, I need you to know that the time of the latter rain, as the prophet says, it is not some time in the future. It is not some time way down the road. She says that if we pray for it, if we seek it, if we long for it, we can have him right now in our time. But friends of mine, what I'm saying we got to do is we got to become a people. And again, nothing wrong with you getting your hair done and have his nice shoes. I, I, I ain't got nothing to say about that. But we got to be more focused on the infilling than the outfits. Some of us build the external at the expense of the internal. We, we, we've got to have multiple types of gathering. You ought to seek God in private. But guess what, man? The book of Hebrews says, For take not the assembling of yourselves with one another, as is the manner of some. And he speaks prophetically, but he says, Do it all the more as you see the day approaching. And I accept the fact that gathering is different than what it was. If you gather in community online, let God be praised there also. But you know what God is calling us to? He's calling us to be a church of oneness. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one message. He has not called us to fractions and divisions. He has called us to operate as one as he and the Father are one. I know the hour is late, but I want you to meditate on the words of this song. Now I want to invite us corporately to make some decisions about how we're going to move, how we're going to function, how we're going to operate as the body of Christ. If God has been good to you, can you put your hands together and praise today? Anointing. Yes, sir. Praise God. Let it fall on me. Yes, sir. Standing to our feet. I'm, I'm keenly aware of the hour. But I promise you, friends, that I've spent my week between the porch and the altar not to just be entertaining so you will say it was good. But the Lord has put a burden on my heart 
to see the Spirit of God fall in such a way on this church that it changes the way we do business until the Lord comes. Maybe you came this week just because it was a certain year. Maybe you came just to see some friends. Maybe you came to honor or to, to be honored. It doesn't really matter why you came. They came to the, the day of Pentecost just to celebrate the completion of the grain harvest. But God had something else in mind. And I believe that every time we gather in Jesus' name, we ought to be candidates for the outpouring of the latter rain. And so today, friends, I want to invite you. You're simply saying, Pastor, I, I want to be the type of believer that's focused more on internal growth as opposed to external projection. I, I, I want to combine both my private worship and my public gathering, and I want to be a vessel of unity. I don't want to be a vessel of discord. I don't want to be a vessel of strife. I want to be a part of the solution and never a part of the problem. If that's you today, wherever you are, I invite you to just push down to the front. I want to pray a corporate prayer that the Spirit of God would fall fresh, that God's Spirit would fall anew, that God would do a new thing in us, a new thing for us, so, so if you're here today and you say, I, I need my greatest need, my greatest need is for more of his spirit, won't you come? 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 Come. Come on, would you come? We'll wait for you. This is why we have come. This is why we have come. Because at some point, there's going to be a gathering like this where the earth begins to shake. And we will see and experience the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And I guess my thought today, if it's going to happen, why not today? Why not now? And why not let me be a witness to it? And I don't want to be so close where I can hear it but I'm so far enough where I can't experience it. So do me a favor, go ahead and bring it down just a little bit. I'm going to pray. But I do believe every worker in the church, you ought to be here. Every worker in the church, you ought to be here. You ought to be here. Everybody who loves the church, you ought to be here. those who want the anointing of God in a fresh, new way, I invite you to come. I invite you to come. Before I pray, we're going to do what the disciples did. Because the cloven tongues fall on us individually, let there be in the house of God some time of personal confession and repentance. See, I, I would say I want to pray for you, but guess what? The old system of types and priesthood, that's been torn down. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm praying with you today. You don't need a priest. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a go-between. You can go straight to the throne yourself today. So right now, let there be confession, repentance in the house of the Lord. There just may need to be some repentance. If you spent more time in preparation for today's service on the outside, than you did on the inside. Let there be repentance in the house of God.
Just take a few moments to confess all known sin. Rend your heart and not your garments before the Lord our maker today. Cloven tongues of fire rest on your people, Jesus. And now you're committing yourself to being a vessel of unity. To say, I'm, I'm, I'm staying out the comment section. And I'm going to live in the action section. You're saying, I don't want to be a hearer. I want to be a doer. And you want to say, listen, I realize I've got a legit point of view. I've got a legit difference with the way church does things. Listen, that's not what I'm dealing with. But I'm saying at some point we got to lay the difference aside. And we got to get in the upper room where the difference can be transformed. Your difference is legit. That's not where I'm at. But I'm saying we got to approach it differently. So in this moment of unity, let there be a symbol. Would you join hands with those connected with you just close by? If you're COVID conscious, just touch elbows, touch shoulders. As we pray what Jesus prayed for us, that he would make us one. Father in heaven, Lord, my prayers have no more merit than anyone's here. But Lord, we just rehearse your express desire that as a last day church, we would be one. Lord, your servant talks about how in the upper room there was a singleness of mind and that there was no division amongst them. Father, I'm praying that you would help us to set aside both personal and worldview differences, doctrinal differences, and help us to come together in close Christian fellowship. Father, I pray in the matchless name of J Jesus that unity would not be just a concept, but that it would be the lived truth for the church in our time. Father, we just take the time today to have a moment where we beat our swords into plow shields. And we put both hands on the plow and we make the covenant to not look back. Father, we realize that there is a dying world that cares nothing about our internal disputes. They just need to know that there is a Jesus who saves and a Lord who is coming again. So, Father, I pray that even as we work through our differences with intentionality, intelligence, anointing, and focus, may we never allow the difference to get in the way of the main thing, which is the gospel to the entire world. May women's ordination not permanently divide us. May diet not divide us. May liturgy not divide us. May, may, may the way we operate not be the way that thing that divides us. But Lord, may we be bound together with such a love for Jesus, such a love for the church for which he died in the church that he is sanctifying and coming back to receive. And help all of us under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit to join me in saying we call a truce. We call a truce over issues of worship, diet, dress. And Lord, as we call a truce, it doesn't mean that we stop fighting. It simply means we start fighting together. 
Lord, as we approach these disputes, may we not approach them with opinions and I think, I felt, or, or, or I feel, but may the scriptures be the arbiter in every dispute. May we go back to the word line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and help us to move our point of view out of the way, Jesus. Lord, let there be a truce in the Oakwood community. Lord, help each and every principle to, to be able to lay the differences aside so that we can come together under the blood-stained banner so that young children of color may be able to enter to learn and they will be given the tools to depart to serve. So come, Holy Spirit. Come. Let me change that. Lord, I thank you for coming. I thank you for creating this moment. I thank you for bringing us to a place of truce where we do not ignore issues, but we work with them with the wisdom that heaven alone is able to provide for the betterment of your church, your school, your people, and your children. Bless, keep, and cover us. And may Oakwood from this point forth experience exponentially supernatural growth. May Ephesians 3.20 be our reality now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. Bless us. Keep and cover us. And may drops that fell from the head of the anointed one, Jesus, continue to fall on us. This is my prayer. This is our collective plea. And now it is our expectation and hope. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Let those who love him say amen. Let those who love him shout hallelujah. Let those lift holy hands putting their hands together, thanking him in advance, thanking him that the Spirit has come and that he will abide and that he would do new work in us. Yes, sir, God bless you. concert everything adjusted by half an hour saints and all of those that are honor classes we're going to do it different this year we want you to fellowship right where you're seating where you're sitting right now we will call your class up as we need you thank you benediction shall we look to the lord as we pray gracious father in heaven we're truly blessed today by the message you gave to us through your manservant, Dr. Snell. We pray earnestly for a special blessing upon your school, our beloved Oakwood University, as you have blessed it during these past 128 years. May Oakwood continue to pray, prepare and educate leaders not only for our denomination, but leaders that will represent you around the world until you return. Bless us and keep us in your hand during these uncertain times that we live. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen, amen, and amen. May I have the classes of 1949 to 1964? The ramp to the to the to your 
to your left, Such and we will a exit to the right. Wonderful service, uh, culminating the this part of our Oakwood University alumni experience. 128 years. Wow. Can you believe that? I can't believe wow. it. Can you believe it? And such a blessing to be here. Uh, Pastor Deblier Snell, honor class of 1999, silver class, this is 25th year, and really had a powerful word. And what I heard was unity. Right. Unifying us, uh, not dividing us, and growing. And he yes. used the text in the very end talking about exceedingly, abundantly, abundantly. above all we could ask. Now that is or always think. one of the most powerful scriptures that we hear. Right. And his sermon title, False Pretenses, he touched on so many things. But most of all, we took, got the takeaway that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to affect that change. And one of the things that he said that made everyone chuckle, but made the point stick is that so many times we want the Lay's anointing, like the Lay's chips anointing, right. to be puffed up, to have the appearance of having a lot going on on the inside, but not really having that going on. But he emphasized that we need to have God's character inside of us right. in order to be the best that we can be. Yes, and that's such, um, that's what you want. Goes yeah. back to our theme, much more than enough. Like right? that exceedingly abundantly. It's more, much more than enough. And that's what he's promised. Mm -hmm. And so in all things, God has promised that he will take care of our legacy school, Oakwood University. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful for his promisings being yes and, and amen. amen. And amen. We have such um, a fun-filled day, a spiritual amen. day as we wrap up uh, this alumni. Mm -hmm. um, as far as our Sabbath services, as you may, uh, hopefully you heard Emil Peeler, just Emil Parker. <laughs> Somebody put that in my head earlier. I apologize. <laughs> Emil Parker said that our evening services are pushed back about a half 30 an minutes. hour, 30 minutes. And so the Aeolians, the Vespers was supposed to be at 615. And we had one correction. Yes, um, I know on the program it said it's going to be here in the Von Braun, but actually it will be at the Oakwood University Church so, on campus. So that will start at 645, yeah. at 645 at the Oakwood University Church. Mm -hmm. Also, um, there was a program this evening, and everything's just been pushed back one half hour. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you are yes. aware. and. You get your Sabbath lunch in. Right, right. Yeah. You may right. not be able to get that nap in, uh, <laughs> but you can definitely get that that lunch in so you can move to your next assigned right, appointment. Right, right. And if you're there for the honors class program, just stay there. You won't miss anything. You have your get seat your good already. Seat. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> you have your seat already. You won't miss any of the program. Right. But right. yes. And that's one of the nice things about the afternoon programs. They kind of just dovetail into mm -hmm. one into another. But there's a variety of things going on, mm -hmm. not just this afternoon, but this evening as mm -hmm. well. But everybody has something they can enjoy. Right. Right. I think that's the wonderful thing about alumni. There's something that For everyone. everybody right. can be a part of and enjoy. Mm -hmm. So that's that's such a beautiful thing. Yes. 8 o'clock, the Dynamic Praise Choir will celebrate their 35th or continuing celebration mm -hmm. at Madison Mission Church. And so, uh, as we like to call it, the new choir. Uh, <laughs> the new choir under the direction of Bryce Davis, who was, um, an, which was um, honored last night. Right, right. They are actually doing a robe dedication. Robe and so I'm know. interested to see what these new robes and look like. And Bryce is stepping down as the director. Oh, that wow. Yeah. And this will be his last concert, and he's going to be introducing um, the new director. Okay. Who is actually Donna McPray's first female director. Right. So we've wow. had female directors before, but not, not a, a head. head director. Head. Right. Yes. Nice. So, so we congratulate Kaylin Griffin yes. on that yes. wonderful achievement. Yes. Wonderful achievement. And we're yes. praying for you, Kaylin. Yes. We know you're going to do awesome. You have a lot of support mm -hmm. behind you. All right. As we move to the Sunday events, want to remind you, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, they're having a soccer game on wow. the campus of Oakwood University. Football. Foot, uh, thank you. <laughs> Depends on where you're from, right? Uh -huh. right so right. that will be at 9 o'clock. We will also have Miss Oakwood pageant, 30-plus years. Miss. Miss, um, thank you, Ray, because yeah. you started that Mr. and Miss. Still going strong. Still going strong. Um, that God. will happen on the campus of Oakwood University tomorrow evening. Mm -hmm. 
And so we are doing that so families can come and be a part. I think there are four contestants. Awesome. Um, we're excited to see what will happen and who the Mr. and Miss Oakwood would be for 24-25. I see one of the contestants over here looking at us right now, <laughs> wishing you the best tomorrow. Um, he'll do well. And then who else do we have? What else do we have tomorrow going on? Well, the don't forget <laughs> the, the major, the major expo. Yes. Oh, yes, right. the, the vendor market. expo. The, the vendor. vendors. You got to get your Oakwood shirts. Get all your merch. <laughs> get it now before it's gone. Right. Get it while the prices are good. Right, And right. please wear your Oakwood merch, not just for Alumni Weekend, but throughout the year. Represent. Right. Right. Show your love for Oakwood University. The Oakwood Pride. And that location has changed. It is now by the statue in the middle of campus. Well, kind of in the middle, depending yes. on where. Uh, the where Monument you, of yes. Service. Yes. The mon is that what it's called? The Monument of the Service. Monument of, speaking of, <laughs> that was um, erected during the time of Dr. Baker. That's yes. right. We have a question for Dr. Baker. We certainly yes. do. And we, we're going to ask him when we see him up close and personal. But where is that student, Kevin? There is yeah, somebody. Is Kevin? We need to put out an APB on Kevin. Kevin. Uh, for those who don't know, Kevin was a student mm -hmm. at Oakwood University. That we think college. I'm college. sorry. Oh, college, yes, because we That's all graduated right. from the college. Correct. But yeah. it was he was conceptualized by Dr. Baker. Right. And this student was ideal. He uh -huh. had... He came from a situation. Kevin in his backpack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kevin in his backpack, walking around the campus. But Kevin yes. was an amazing student, and yes. every, um, I would say, every achievement that the mm -hmm. school had, Kevin was a part of. Right. Yes. We just don't know what class. We don't know if this is one right. of his honor class or not. We don't. You know, All we, we don't saw know. was his back, like Moses yes. in the class. We don't even know what he looks like, really. We don't even know what he looks like. So we right. can't recognize him. Right. So the question is for Dr. Baker. What happened to Kevin? Where's Kevin? Where is Kevin, Kevin, are you yes. out there today? We need, we need something. Did he Dr. graduate? Baker. Did he graduate? Did he is he still around? Yes. Is he still in Huntsville? Yes. yes. Did he do leap? Oh, that is true. Did or, he do leap? Or the was maps master's program? Yes. 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 Has he gotten his master's degree in religion? What, uh, what, what yeah. have he done? You know, Kevin actually could be a professor now he, at the university. We don't know. That is true. We could. don't know. He could have kids here as well. That's yeah. right. That's so right. Kevin could have found his wife here on the campus At of Oakland, campus. just right. living his best life. So That's we need right. to find out where Kevin is. Where is Kevin? We'll be coming to you, Dr. Baker, and we'll have that answer for you all <laughs> at another right. time. But that just reminiscent of the time that we are celebrating. And it's time to go. Yes. Uh, we have had a fabulous time being with you uh, on this, I don't even know what number this is for, for alumni. Yeah. We just know we're celebrating 128 <laughs> years. That's amazing to me. Uh, I remember the 100th. Wow. in 1996 and so it's a blessing to still be here and be in the number that's yes. right that's right that's right so we want to make sure you get all your sabbath um alumni pictures outside by the pond mm -hmm. get that good potluck the yes. food in yes and make sure you're back for this evening at what time? 6.45. 6.45. 6.45. So everything has been moved back in half an hour and want to remind you of that very important announcement. Well, we're about to go uh, so they can make sure that they wrap up the pictures for the honor classes, classes of four and nine. Congratulations to you. We had a class from 1949. I think yes. that was our oldest class where wow. someone was living. Uh, congratulations to all of you. God bless you. Hope you enjoy your family, uh, your Oakwood family, more, much more than enough. I'm Audrey Johnson. I'm Raymond King. And I'm Janine Lindor. We'll see you next time. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.